थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव हेलो एवरीवन आई होप आई एम ऑडिबल यस आई एम ऑडिबल सर या आई एम डॉक्टर केतन बदानी एंड आई विश गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल द पीपल एंड डेलीगेट्स एंड फैकल्टी इन इंडिया एंड आई विश अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल आर फैकल्टी एंड पीपल फ्रॉम द हॉस्पिटल फॉर स्पेशल सर्जरी एंड ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द बॉम्बे स्पाइन सोसाइटी आई वेलकम ऑल द फैकल्टी गेस्ट फैकल्टी फ्रॉम एच एस एस एंड फ्रॉम आर साइड uh in this uh, at this uh, meeting between the two uh, organizations while the hospital for special surgery is a very well known place a uh, very well known organization at the epitome of orthopedics in the world and it has for those who don't know it's probably ranked uh, best hospital for the last 12 years uh on our side the bombay spine society is a new relatively young organization and uh the loosely the uh, group of spine surgeons have been practicing in bombay cohesively for the last 20 years and they have been holding spine meetings mm-hmm. uh, clinical meetings and uh, a yearly cadaveric spine course for the young upcoming spine surgeons but uh, we came together and in 2016 uh, at the behest of our senior orthopedic surgeon a uh, senior spine surgeons uh, an association was formed which is now officially the bombay spine society it consists of a cohesive group of uh, spine surgeons including the stalwarts in spine surgery and those who have uh, been uh, instrumental in installing the or establishing spine practice in the city of mumbai and in india moreover mumbai is uh, the very at the forefront of spine surgery in india so most of the academic activities in india are held by the bombay spine society i welcome dr girardi dr sakunbi who are a very well known and eminent faculty from the hospital for special surgery and uh, uh, i uh, hope that this association between the bombay spine society and the uh, hospital for special surgery is carried forward in the future as well and we can have many collaborative meetings uh, and sharing of academic ideas uh, dr ranawat has been a very important figure from hospital for special surgery and he has had a very deep academic connections with the indian orthopedics and i hope i hope that our spine society can carry forward these relations and have very useful academic activities in the future with this i uh, invite dr jardi uh, and dr sakunbi to join us and dr satyan mehta our secretary of the society will take over the proceeds from now thank you uh thank you sir uh, dr ketan badani is the president of our bombay spine society uh, thank you very much sir and under your uh, guidance we have been uh, going ahead and organizing these uh, meetings uh, over to the meeting straight away uh, 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 dr girardi is uh, our first speaker and he does he needs no introduction uh, he is uh, an eminent uh, spine surgeon uh, from the hss hospital new york having more than i, I don't know 300 publications uh, and uh, Uh, multiple book chapters and uh, and what not uh, uh, so it, it's a great honor to have you sir and uh, without further ado please uh, go ahead and uh, start your presentation sir thank you so much everybody um and uh, it is an honor a pleasure to to be with you and, and see all friends um can you see my uh, slides Yes, we can. Good. I can do the slideshow. Every time I try the slideshow, it, it just uh, freezes. So I, I hope you can see it well. So I'm going to talk about lateral fusion, which is a concept not new, but we've been using it since the early 2000s, and we have gathered a lot of experience with many surgeons here. So even though I'm giving the talk, I hope I'm representing well what we all think about this technique, which it, in our service uh, I have uh, I've done many, many. Uh, uh, cases and um, I hate to use names so or brand names. So the lateral surgery is what we use. It's a transoatic approach. Many companies have come with different names. Uh, lately, uh, uh, the prone lateral fusion has been also uh, uh, developed, and I briefly will talk about that. Why is it, is, is a unique technique? Because when you look at the vertebral body, 
the edges are the strongest part when patient has weak bone, which we see is more and more common. The size of the footprint is bigger than an a lif or definitely by a t lift or a PLIF. And when you come sideways, you can really restore alignment and height by taking advantage of the ligaments. And you can reduce sagittal or coronal uh, or short uh, 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 deformities. You can indirectly decompress the foramen just by distracting uh, um, evenly the disc, uh, uh, the M plates. The advantage is basically it's a lateral axis through the psoas, the annulus, and then two and posterior annulus are preserved and the ligaments are preserved. So in theory, you're actually restoring some stability by distracting. So it could definitely be used as a standalone, which is an area that I'm very interested in because it has allowed us to treat patients differently and patients that otherwise we wouldn't treat as using complicated screw constructs will fail in some of these patients. It's very powerful for coronal uh, uh, correction, as I will show. We avoid the vessels and uh, makes an advantage in terms of the approach. What are the drawbacks or disadvantages? It's the plexus, obviously, the psoas, which is a muscle that in some patients get very swollen, some patients don't. And then they have some sort of a lingering pain or numbness, which is not nerve related, but it's the psoas itself. And I'll also talk about that. Sensory nerve injuries that again, it goes with the psoas inflammation, the inability to access the disc space. Not everybody's a candidate for this. Some four fives are really deep into the pelvis uh, or some 12 ones or L1-2 because of the ribs are difficult or you have to decide uh, to go through the uh, uh, chest cavity, which might not be ideal. Cage misplacement, migration, subsidence. And subsidence is also a topic for discussion because sometimes it's not a real subsidence, it's us violating the end plates. And, and then uh, once you violate the end plates, as we know, the bone is soft and it collapses, but it's more an intra-op violation. Fractures are also possible. The surgical technique, I will touch briefly because we have changed it from the initial technique. The side of the approach left, right, is depends on the levels. Obviously in this case, you wanna go four or five will determine the side of the approach. You can go address this patient through the uh, concave, through the basically collapsed disc because you can't get there on the convex side. So you have to be on the concave side to get access to it. On the MRI, things that we look at is the position of the psoas. Sometimes the psoas is so until we call that the Mickey Mouse sign because of the ears of the Mickey Mouse uh, hat. And if it's too until and the plexus is behind, it may not be a good candidate for this approach. Why did we change? because we saw with the help of, of our vascular surgeon, Dr. Fentini, over the years, is that just going for a little bigger incision from the get-go, you save time, less muscle uh, um, uh, injury, and also you can see uh, the nerves and moving when you sit. So we don't really rely on, on the dilator technique and the EMG that a lot of companies push. We, uh, we, we believe more in seeing the nerve root and moving it, especially for sensory nerves, uh, but visualization is key. And I'll show you uh, uh, in a few slides. So these are the two techniques, the one that you're dilating, but at the end of the day, the incision goes from two centimeters to three. We don't think it makes a big deal, but the, 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 the fast approach and the safe approach, we believe is, is what is, uh, uh, more important. Um, we have uh, described the technique, as I mentioned, with all our colleagues, Dr. Fentini, Camisa, Sama, Hughes, etc., uh, which we all collaborate with again, uh, Dr. Fentini. The key, the position is the most important part because if you position right, you can get access, as well as you don't have to continuously get x rays, which we don't like. Once we mark, as I mentioned here, that there's no rotation, we do the skin marks for the levels that we're gonna do. We mark the front, we mark the back. As you can see here, this is a three, four, four, five level. The incision goes from top to bottom, from posterior to anteriorly, and addressing both levels. Once the skin and the subcute is cut, then it's all blood, blood dissection with two Kelly clamps in different directions, getting into the retroperitoneal space. Once we see the fat, we move it with our finger. And then we just two simple renal retractors and a dissector following the fibers of the psoas. 
we find the disk space, we corroborate with x-rays, and then we put a retractor and from there it's easy. And if a patient is well fixed into the table and we don't lose positioning, then it's really fast and you don't have to keep taking x-rays because you already know your limit as you can see on the skin marks front and back and you work perfectly uh, uh, in, in perpendicular position. Then the distraction is quite powerful. As you can see here in the United States, we do use BMP, which allow us in many cases to not use pedicle screws because we know that it heals and we know when it heals versus putting synthetics and other countries don't have this and it takes a long time to heal. And then in those cases, then a standalone might not be as friendly use as here because again, we have the ability to use BMP too. This is a post-op exercise. This is a great technique for adjacent level disease, as you can see on this fluoro uh, 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 view, and then the skin is closed. The indications, there's a lot of indications that they're evolving, like degenerative scoli, degenerative spondylolisthesis, non-union, adjacent breakdown, degenerative disease, but also has given access to other things like motion preservation or removal of implants that going in the front will be quite dangerous. Some cases, this is a case of adults, you know, degenerative scoli with multi-level foramen stenosis, very uh, degenerative end plates. And you can see the restoration of height by doing, now with these end plates that they were really not uh, in great shape, we, I decided to also complement with a posterior gesture. Um, as you can see here, this is a patient that is quite unstable above. So the lateral surgery allows us to restore height, to reduce this retrospondyl disease, and then we just added two screws posteriorly. This is a patient that is interesting because after a long fusion with a flat back, he was seen by other colleagues who recommended a big osteotomy, a PSO and, blood, and, and, and a big surgery. And you can see how powerful it is to trust just one level uh, lateral surgery and then complemented by posterior fixation. You can see a restoration of good alignment by just doing one level and decompressing the adjacent level. For curves that are bigger, Obviously you can do that as a standalone, but, but just correcting the bottom, like four, five, three, four, two, three, when you go in the back, it's very easy to uh, uh, do the rest of the job because once you go from lateral border to lateral border of the disc space, the spine really gets quite loose and you can bring them to the midline easily. When do we use standalone? And this is a technique that I like because as I said before, if it goes well, it's, it's a home run. Uh, this is adjacent level disease, as you can see here, it can easily be treated because it, it, if it's collapse or lateral disease, those are the best candidates. And you can really decompress indirectly by restoring height. And you can see how the ligament flavum and, and the ligament, the portion is doing ligament unfold uh, uh, once you distract. Two levels, adjacent level with, is, with lateral fusion, we stand alone, one level, uh, uh, degenerative disc uh, that I believe that that was the source of his pain and, 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 and that was the case. Two levels, this was a professional skier. And definitely, at least in my hands, this is a much better solution for the patient than pedicle screws and damaging the posterior musculature when you can. Obviously not everybody is a candidate for this. This is a, a, a patient that after laminectomy, after neogenic claudication was resolved he still has some radicular complaints due to collapse at three, four and four, five. And you can really restore just foraminal volume with a very small operation. In retrospect, you could say, well, if this patient would have been treated with pedicle screws from the get-go, didn't need any second surgery, which is true. But it's an elegant solution when this happens. Patient that have skipping levels pathology, like this patient have contralateral thigh pain and contralateral L4, five symptoms. And instead of doing like L2 and L5 posterior fusion, you can treat selectively. And this patient, as I know him for years because he's the daughter of one of our anesthesiologists and she's doing well for more than 10 years. And you can see how just addressing the problem and restoring height and realign it, uh, you can decompress the foramen and the lateral rhesus. Cases with like this, with degenerative scoli, with contralateral radiculopathy, again, treat it. Why do we use screws sometimes? Because once you distract, and the ligament, until ligament is wrapped, then you can't put the spacer alone because it will displace. So this is not for instability. This is only to preserve the cage in place. If your patient is unstable to begin with, then you need pedicle screws. 
but if a patient has a collapse and doing the surgery, you realize that because of the distraction, the ligament rupture, then you have to provide some stability because otherwise it will migrate until it, which is not good. It has been some controversy about the sagittal alignment with these devices because uh, uh, many surgeons believe you can restore sagittal contour or lordosis. And as you can see on these patients, the patient is over 80. And it's not perfect, but you can see on the far right how the alignment is definitely better. And, and it's a decent solution for somebody uh, uh, like an elder, elder, elderly patient. And when you ask about bone quality, I can argue that screws not, they're not great for poor bone quality either. And sometimes less is better. A lot has been talked about complications, especially of lateral alone, like implant subsidence, no union nerve injury has been, many surgeons believe that you cannot do this. You shouldn't do this at four or five, and I'll show you <clears throat> otherwise. Vascular injury also, it could be a problem with the ascending iliac lumbar vein, uh, um, which again, likely doesn't happen often. GI issues and radiation. Radiation is a problem that we as surgeons uh, will we should take consideration uh, as we do in many of these. Uh, we don't want to uh, have too much radiation. So this is these are cases that we see. Sometimes we put the employee, we put the devices. They look great. They go home and they call with severe pain. Doesn't mean that they need another surgery. The recovery obviously is harder. We put them in a brace. We continue with the treatment for metabolic bone disease. But many of these, even though they collapse, they lose height, they end up healing as well. So it's not, you don't have to rush to operate on them because again, in the, some of these patients, if you put screws, maybe if you use cement, maybe if you use many levels, but many of these patients will end up healing anyway. Like these patients, and especially in the beginning, as I mentioned, we've been doing this since 2005. And in the beginning, we like to put a very tall device into the disc space. And that's not ideal because everything that goes up comes down. And as you over distract, basically you're damaging the amplice and then it will collapse. Then they heal, but they don't have an easy recovery. This is a patient that has initially an interspinous device done in Europe and, and, and we remove them. And at the same time, we just did an inside, we did, did a lot of fusion. I remember in this case, I put a 14 implant, which is too big and then it collapsed, but then end up healing and then he did well. Risk factors for collapse, advanced age, osteoporosis, and increased sagittal facet orientation. Those are risk factors that we've seen over the years. We've done tremendous work. Alex Hughes has been here looking into bone density, bone quality, and M plates. And we've seen that basically that we can, with CT scan, with QCT scan, we can really see, measure the density right under the M plate, and we can uh, we can tell beforehand which patient may not be a good candidate for a stand alone, or they may need some different gesture like cement or, or screws or an interspinous device, as I will show you soon. So we've seen that patients that have sclerotic amplates is subside less than when they don't have sclerotic amplates. We also seen that the psoas size, the stronger the psoas is, the more collapse will be because it's pulling down and we, uh, uh, we have seen this uh, and policy recently. We also seen uh, that different materials will have less potential for subsidence. Like here, this is a comparison of a 3D printed titanium versus peak, which is what I use. Um, most of my colleagues use uh, uh, titanium. And, and we've seen that the truth is that the titanium subsides less than peak. It may be more friendly to the bone. Now, this is what I mentioned briefly before. Patients that have intra violation of the amplates, or we know the bone is poor, then we can definitely do without changing positions a small incision posteriorly and complement by attaching the spinous process, basically uh, uh, grabbers that provide a stability. And we know that osteoporotic patients that have better bone quality and quantity in the posterior elements than in the vertebral body, and you just cram the spinous process. It's not a motion preservation device. It's basically you, you're compressing the spinous process. And as you can see here, how even though this, you know, the amplates were violated initially, how it end up fusing nylis. This patient is 10 years out and now we have problems above. 
some of these patients' complications, this patient felt well, and two weeks later, he works for a company that deliver mail, and he started rotating, and he came back for follow-up, and you can see the implant coming out. Uh, he was still doing well, uh, but I, we revised it and, and put the screws to provide stability, and he ended up healing nicely. We did an algorithm, uh, which I'm not going to bore you about which patient should benefit from a standalone and which uh, it, it wouldn't. And that goes with everything that I mentioned before. Nerve damage. We look at this for many years. We look at thousands of patients, and we've seen that the learning curve has shown us that basically the more we do, the less trouble we have, but also we understand how it happened more and more. Many of these patients, they wake up and they're fine. And it just takes a few days to develop leg pain or weakness. So we see the lay response, which is sort of a swelling of the sauce with everything that goes with. So it's not a direct injury to the nerve that the patient wakes up with a weak knee or a weak or a foot drop. It's, it's basically 48 hours later and 72 hours later. Four or five will look at this, and 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 uh, most motor deficit do not happen at four or five. We also see problems on the other side, which initially we didn't understand why how, why a patient may have pain or weakness on the other side, and we think is sometimes we push this material. It's a positioning, a hematoma, BMP uh, 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 leakage, as you can see here. Uh, some of these patients develop a contralateral seroma, as you can see on this MRI. Uh, and to the point that develop bone uh, if the BMP leaks on the other side. Some patients have psoas pain, which could be quite disabling. And what we've done lately is we target the psoas, we aspirate fluid, and we inject steroids. And it seemed to be helpful in the beginning. We look at outcomes, and, and the truth is, is some, you know, it's not a perfect technique, but nothing is. But if you can get a 70, 80% improvement with something so small, is something to look at. We look at radiation and we've seen that it's really safe. Uh, uh, you need to really deal, you, you really have to do more than 2,700 lateral fusions a year to be at the edge of radiation. Prone lateral, I'm just gonna briefly say that it could, uh, is an option. Uh, it has had some problems with bowels, which should not happen. You need a special table because you really have to move away so the pelvis uh, is out of your way. Obviously, uh, I don't have experience, but it's something that is out there. So in summary, it's an excellent tool for simple and complex spine pathology. It's very powerful to, uh, for correction, for distraction. Uh, it's, it's a stable technique because you're just restoring height and ligament tension. Allows instrumentation, uh, it allows the thoracic area as well. We can get to 5.1, obviously. Uh, and it's a new option for the elderly. And, and I think that's it. And I really appreciate your listening to this. Thank you, sir, uh, for an excellent uh, talk on uh, uh, the uh, lateral uh, approach to this uh, fusion. Um, and uh, this is something which we are seeing more and more nowadays. And uh, we are getting more and more indications to do this as well. Um, so we have a few questions for you. And I'll just start off. Uh, with uh, we uh, very often we take this uh, approach up for uh, degenerative uh, scoliosis uh, patients, and uh, in these uh, kind of cases, is there something specific that you look at uh, when you uh, take them up? And also, is there uh, what are the different challenges in the surgical approach for uh, degen scoli? Sure, it definitely is a good technique for degenerative scoli. We'll look at you first decide if it's a technique for a standalone or you're going to complement it with screws. If you're gonna do it for standalone, a patient that has sagittal imbalance is not a good candidate. The patient that have instability like spondylolisthesis is not a good candidate for a standalone. You decide the side of the approach on the concavity, as I mentioned, and it's very important that each level may need a complete different angulation or either on the X-ray machine, or you may have to rotate the table. Each level has a different rotation because what end up happening otherwise you may end up in the foramen on the other side. So you have to do one level, and then the next level, you may either have to airplane this way, this way, but you really always have to work perpendicular to the disk space. Um, you need curve instruments. Like if you really work on four, five, and two, three, some of these companies have curve instruments, which are very helpful to avoid violating the end plates. If you use uh, bone graft, that is not BMP, then you can be more aggressive on the end plates. But if you use BMP 
you don't want to violate the amplase because then the BMP will cause also an osteoclastic reaction. <clears throat> and then you end up having cysts on the amplase, which are not good because then they subside. Um, but basically, uh, also the patient's symptoms are very important because if the patient's symptoms is just radicular, then you can really open the foramen up. If the patient has primarily neurogenic claudication and they don't have back pain, I may just end up doing a laminectomy only. So it depends on the patient complaints. We always prioritize what the patient's complaints are. Then we examine them. Then we look at the pictures and then we come up with a surgical plan, right? So that's the algorithm that we do. But again, prioritizing what, why is the patient seen as a, as a patient and what can we do for them? Um, so those are, those are basically uh, tips. If you're going to do the posterior uh, uh, approach and it's a big curve, you don't, you want to correct the lower levels. You don't want to get into a transition of a thoracolumbar because you may fix the deformity because it doesn't derotate. So if you're going to go like T4 to the pelvis, then I wouldn't put cages at one, two, two, three, because you, you're not going to correct much. And when you go in the back, it's sort of fixed. You can bring it to the midline. So those are my, my small comments. Before we go to the next question, uh, I, we, we have talked about going into the concave side of the degenerative scoli to open it up. Am I right? Is that yes, because, it, because it's the only one that you can get access to 4-5. Because if a concavity to 4-5 is going to be pointing up, you cannot get from the convexity because of the pelvis. And what about the other levels? Would you still prefer to go to the concave side at 2-3 and 3-4? Yeah, because once you position and you break the table, they open up. So okay. it's a little more challenging. Obviously, it would be easier for the convexity like you normally would do in an open case. But mm -hmm. because of you want to address four or five, is you have to go in the concavity. Thank you. Dr. Ayush, your question. Yeah, so thank you for an excellent talk. And I do uh, do quite a bit lateral. And I started with direct lateral. And then I went to uh, anterior to source. We started doing this with uh, neuromonitoring, and then we realized that if you just open it a bit and you retract the swaths under vision, you don't really need a neuromonitoring. And I can tell you, last two, three years, we have not done a single case with neuromonitoring. And our, I agree. Complication, our complication rate for the angry swaths syndrome has really, really gone down. And I believe that uh, even uh, so, I, I like to pick your brain on that, and I believe going anterior and you giving yourself room and just retracting the source really makes your life much more easy than going through the source. Just a thought process. I know we come from the, just my own experience with the, uh, with the surgery and your, your thoughts on that. No, I agree. I agree about neuromonitoring. I'd rather see it and move it. Um, I don't think you need monitoring unless you do the dilator technique, but uh, and you're unlucky and you go through the nerve with the K-wire. But um, I think anterior to a source is, is obviously the, we call it here, the OLIF. Um, it's a good technique, primarily for four or five. The, the only caveat is some patients, they have such a big source that it's hard to push back and get enough space to do what you need to do, working on the other side and distracting evenly. And then you end up putting... I'm talking about standalone, for a standalone. You really can do a good job, as good as a job as when you go exactly in the middle. And I'm sure in some patients that have a very small sauce, you can do it, but it's in my experience, or at least in my hands, sometimes the sauce is, is this big and you really cannot push it back uh, enough to get at least to the posterior third of yeah. the disc space, which is where we want to work. I, I agree with you. There are cases where we don't do it because, you know, but now because of what we have been doing for quite some time, we can really pick those patients beforehand based on our MRI. So, you know, there, I think in my book, there, there's 10 to 15 percent patient where we choose not to do it exactly for the reasons you spoke about, but still 80 to 85 percent of the patient, I think only if that, at least in my hand, it works. And till now we have very, very good experience. But Good to know your thoughts on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Pavar, your question. Yeah, that was an excellent talk, Dr. Girardi. Yeah, my question is the same to you. Like, have you shifted to OLIF uh, in your practice 
because it is a little more safer to the nerves or you still continue uh, with the x leaf approach uh, which has given you the good results over a period of time no i i i still use a lateral i still go through the saws and as i mentioned the technique just by dissecting uh perpendicular to the fibers and moving this way and this way and being quick uh we really have decreased the amount of problems significantly at the end of the surgery we spread steroids uh, it's not that it doesn't happen but it's really now is it's probably one out of ten patients develop some paresthesis or numbness but not it, it, we tell them ahead of the time and i think that also is a big part of it in the beginning like, you know, like when you do an anterior cervical surgery, when you tell the patient you're going to have a sore throat, they're okay with it. And this is similar. We tell them you may have in your thigh numbness, paresthesias, a little burning. You may be a little weaker. And the truth is either they don't complain about it or they accepted it or we have gotten better at it. But it's really not um, in our practice. It's not really a problem that we have to choose another techniques. I understand the old lift is, is great, but again, uh, I'm not sure if you can do three levels standalone for with the old lift in the same patient um, as well as you can do in the transoatic because of the positioning. But again, it, the, to answer your question, no, I still use a lateral and, and I think we have gotten better at it. Just, just a small comment. I think the key to doing X lift is getting in quick and getting, getting out quick. And that really avoids the complication. I agree. I mean, yeah. So that, that's, that, that's very important. And if you are fa fast and you can get your job very fast and maybe with experience it happens, I think the complication rate doesn't matter much between x lift and over I agree. How many of your patients, Dr. Girardi, did they need to go from the back again and do a micro decompression? Or do you just um, press the indirect decompression which achieved with the old x lift approach? We did a study years ago and I think we missed, you know, our patient selection is, wasn't as good as now. But 10% of those patients that we did stand alone for stenosis require the compression later. Um, I think now it should be, you know, I'm sure it's less. But in, in the literature we published, it was 10%. So what changed? I mean, have you changed because you saw that there's 10% patients who had... Uh... Well, I think, I think in many cases that we've seen uh, that they have severe central stenosis we may do either posterior alone or a lateral and posterior. Uh, and again, if we only treat, you know, like one or two levels with radiculopathy, standalone is still a good technique. So it depends on the patient's symptom. The patient may have central stenosis, but they may only have like thigh pain, right? Okay. So that patient is a good candidate for a lateral surgery. If the patient has neurogenic claudication that they cannot walk and they don't have a specific nerve root, that might not be a good candidate for indirect decompression. Right. Thank you, Dr. Bhavar. Dr. Badani, your question. Yeah, my question was very similar to uh, Dr. Abhijit's question. So I think it's what answer. What about the uh, need for direct decompression? I think Dr. Girardi just answered. Thank you, sir. So I guess uh, we can go ahead to the next uh, part, uh, which is uh, a case uh, a presentation and discussion uh, by Dr. Abhijit Pawar. Dr. Pawar is our uh, consultant spine surgeon here in Mumbai at uh, Kokila Ben Hospital and uh, uh, an expert at uh, minimally invasive surgeries as well. Uh, go I ahead. Can, I, I, Dr. Gerardi was a mentor actually. I did a fellowship yeah. under him. <laughs> yeah, so he's uh, gotten much better since that time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Gerardi, can you stop screen shares? Yes. Yes, I think it's top. So we're going to just put forth one interesting case for Dr. Girardi and the team at HSS and see what their insight are. So this is a patient with a large L3-4 disc. So this was 35-year-old male patient, obese 135 kgs, who presented with limp while walking and left claudican pain not able to walk greater than 100 meters uh, independently. And this is his MRI. You see this as a, he has a large L3-4 disc, a significant compression more on the left side in the axial view and a large calcified disc. 
this is l3 4 level on examination is slr positive thoracic slr positive and he had knee flexion grade 4 by 5 and ankle dorsal flexion on the left 3 by 5 this were his x rays you can see this calcified disc at the l3 4 level this is the ap view there is uh, no um, no coronal instability there on flexion extension no instability a uh, calcified disc can be seen no lysthesis so dr girardi with this patient young patient extremely obese hard disc at l34 uh, what would be your, your plan of action in this patient I, mean, i think without a matter of compression the patient needs surgery and i think uh, my first approach would be to do a wide you know a bilateral uh, laminectomy laminotomy laminectomy and do a, a, you know discectomy at both levels okay so she would so this patient with this with the options we had microendoscopic endoscopic mis to live so he underwent l4 5 microendoscopic discectomy with quadrant system on the left side his radiculopathy significantly decreased they improved neurologically over 3 months however he had some persistent axial back pain 3 by 10 uh, he was overall satisfied with the outcome at 4 months two years post op he came to us with a follow up and with recurrence of ref, left radicular pain with positive slr the pain was not as bad as what he had before but he definitely has is a little worried about the, the recurrence of pain two years down the line so what i mean did we do anything wrong dr girardi what do you think i mean was the microdic no 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 definitely no i think it, it could happen i mean what you do is you compress it. the disc is 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 you can see that it's not a great disc and it could happen again and i mean if the patient didn't have any actual pain i would still do the same surgery again but if the actual pain becomes more a prevalent or disabling condition then and this pain then then i would probably suggest you know an indirect decompression and 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 stabilization and this is a patient that would probably do a two level you know lateral now okay. can i add something yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. So, so just go back to the first scan, just to show the MRI. Yes. Yeah. So you know, this is a very, very good case to go transfemoral endoscopically because because the disc is sort of um, uh, central and and it is like pushing the dura posteriorly. So it, it, in a way, it's protecting your dura. Once you movement. you in the doc endoscopically trans, especially transfemorally you will exactly exactly doc at the disc and thus here what will happen is the disc is protecting your dura was pushing it quite posteriorly and you can take out the complete thing because you land exactly so considering the level considering the symptom considering it's a central disc i think going transfemoral is the one of the best way and even if you have osteophytes you can really burn them out yesterday we did d11 d12 similar case with complete osteophyte with a with a with a transfemoral approach so you know it it is a game changer especially when it comes to case like this you can do a much better job than calcified this then yeah. yeah yeah you can you can take it out you can nap, you can burn them out complete completely and then uh, and it is much better because you know when you are going to posterior you know this the dura is completely you, you see that it's central disc it is making the dura go very very lateral so you know you have even if you are retracting and going from one side it really becomes very very difficult to approach the whole disc but if you when going to transfemoral you land exactly on the disc and the disc because it pushing the dura posteriorly will protect you from damaging the dura that is what has been my change from being tubular guy to transfemoral guy that is my experience right dr sama you had to say okay. something dr sama Thank you so much. Um I was going to ask that question if it's a hard disc uh how do you address it but uh if you feel confident and and safe uh, using the burr to kind of drill it out uh, I have no experience doing that but that was the concern I had with going transfemorally. Yeah so 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 you can navigate your drills okay and we just did a case of L1 L2 a complete calcified disc and maybe uh, I can present it tomorrow in Bombay Spine Society meet and you can navigate you can see the whole calcification and you can burn it out very very safely it's a it's a game changer it's a game changer i can tell you abhijit i'll take one uh, point further over here right. uh, 
so uh, nothing actually humbles you than uh, your results and your follow up uh, so for a case like this i wanted to get dr kulkarni's opinion uh, with such a bad degenerated disc with a central herniation now this uh, guy has a very high chance of having a recurrence and he is an obese patient as well so in, right at the beginning uh, don't you think would it, it would be better to maybe take this patient for a proper a uh, laminectomy a proper wide laminectomy rather than just a laminotomy and a discectomy and or maybe even consider a fusion in a case like this because this guy has a very high chance of coming back again and again yeah, yeah. so this patient i am would be very scared about having a neuro deficit here and uh, from my uh, you know i appreciate uh, ayush because he's been doing this transforaminal so I, I would safely do a two level minimal invasive tilif in this patient the reason being one it would be safe i would be totally out of the canal the approach will push me to do a tilif here i would easily do a, you know once i excise the facets i would have enough room outside the canal to decompress the 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 dural sac uh, so that is from the safety point of view secondly you will not lose by fusing in two levels if you see flexion extension x ray there is hardly any movement at these two levels and these are very short discs so i won't be uh, in terms of uh, mobility i won't be you know compromising on his mobility much uh, so from both points from safety point of view as well as from you know uh, retaining the disc mobility point of view i would do a two level uh, minimal access if i'm i i believe the top uh, axial section is at l45 it's no, about it's l34 it's same l34 so, so then it would be just l, l i thought it was l45 so i'd be just doing a l34 minimal access to lift correct sir yeah yeah i think even i should have done the same but patient was reluctant to go for any implants and fixations so, so not not looking backwards that you had a recurrence you done an excellent job i been uh, i would be probably uh, it would be difficult for me to do a decompression the, the way you have done it here but uh, right the right from the word go there is day one i have done just an a tilt here not not from the point of view that he has a recurrence from the uh, dr kulkarni why are you worried about uh, neuro deficit here uh, because the conus is far uh, far proximal it's right in the center the dural the the calcified disc right in the center i don't know how to access this from behind you know i would have to go laterally to remove it dr sk srivastav sir uh, you had a different approach to this patient uh no not really as uh, uh, it was pointed out rightly by dr arvind kulkarni i don't do endoscopy but if you see the plain x ray of this patient he has congenital stenosis congenital canal stenosis his pedicles are very narrow so as advised by the other faculties a good decompression is very very important in this case if you see his other disc also lower down also the the at the level of the disc there is still stenosis so this is a good candidate for developing problem in future because he has a very narrow canal congenitally and this is very well picked up by the plain x ray itself otherwise for me it is same approach that i will be tackling the uh, thing totally the decompression is the uh, main important goal so that uh, neurological uh, deficit uh, doesn't uh, appear later on also and recurrence also you take care of when you take out the whole material and i'll be tempting to do a fusion also right right abhijit you can go ahead yeah so i think retrograde i even i feel that i should have done a fusion to begin with uh, so so this is his current scenario he has told he still we are not given any option he is still debating whether he want to do the surgery again i told him that we can go for a nerve block or he can go for a fusion surgery now uh, but he still not come to me again thank you thank you so now thank you I'll just talk by there so now we going to have uh, dr bulabo sukumbi uh, he bulabo was my co fellow when i was a fellow at hss and he has joined as a consultant uh, spine surgeon at hospital for special surgery and an associate professor uh, with while corn medical school so he's going to talk about sacroiliac joint fusion and uh, so bolabo go ahead please uh, good afternoon or good evening over there uh, to my colleagues and thanks for the invitation uh, can you see my screen yes yes and can you hear me yes we can hear you well Uh, I'm going to try the slideshow, but I think similar to Dr. Gerardi, 
How about now? Is that is that okay with the slideshow? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. All right, great. So I'm going to be talking about the sacroiliac joint um, and um, the re-emergence re of uh, uh, fusion procedures for the sacroiliac joint dysfunction, at least in the United States. Um, in the last 10 years, we've seen increased number of these procedures being done. Um, here are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to this talk. All right, so we'll go over so a brief history, some anatomy, uh, some of the diagnostic and imaging challenges associated uh, with uh, sacroiliac joint pain and dysfunction, uh, treatment algorithms, uh, indications, surgical techniques and pitfalls, and some of the uh, evidence to support why there's been increased trend in uh, these procedures being performed, at least in the United States. I'm not sure what the case is in India. So uh, it's, SI joint pain and dysfunction is nothing new. Uh, it's been reported as early as the 1700s, 1800s. Initially, it was thought to be a problem uh, specific or unique to women, uh, uh, particularly childbearing age women, uh, particularly during uh, pregnancy deliveries. Uh, but uh, this has since been disproven. It's been shown uh, to not only be a pain source in both men and women, uh, and uh, but also to actually have uh, some mobility to it. Because... Uh, early on, the thought process was that uh, it wasn't a very mobile joint and that the only time the joint would actually move was during pregnancy and, and childbirth. Uh, this, once again, has since been uh, disproven. So the anatomy, um, uh, so typically the uh, SI joint is formed within the first three sacral segments, uh, S1 through three. Uh, the third segment is not always present. Uh, uh, another interesting fact is that uh, the sacral bones actually do not fully ossify into one bone into sometime into your second to third decade of life, which I, I find kind of interesting. Uh, the bony anatomy is variable, uh, highly variable uh, in size, shape, and contour amongst individuals, men and women. Uh, and that's just something to take into consideration when you look at the anatomy uh, for potential surgical intervention. Uh, stability, as we know, it's an important, it's an important fulcrum for where three uh, moments uh, join, which is the uh, axial uh, a skeleton and the uh, two lower extremities uh, ground reactive forces. So even though it's not a joint that moves a lot, uh, obviously it's a very uh, important joint for pelvic stability. Uh, there have been some studies that actually suggest that something as small as a one centimeter limb length discrepancy can increase the load across the SI joint fivefold. That's important because when you, when you look at these patients uh, from a history uh, standpoint, you, you want to understand the overall patient uh, in totality, making sure that they, they haven't had any low extremity surgeries or pathology that could be driving their SI joint pain. And uh, with any procedures that we do, patient selection is key. So if you're, if you're picking the wrong patient to begin with, your outcomes are gonna be compromised. So that's just something to keep in mind as you evaluate these patients. Uh, initially, innovation was not well-defined, but several studies have uh, come to find that uh, primarily uh, majority of the innovation is from L5 to L3, in some cases from L4 to L3. Uh, there's some good pain management studies where they did some radiofrequency ablation to some of these nerves and found good pain relief um, as it pertains to uh, this distribution. We talked about the motion. The uh, sacrum, um, where it sits between the two iliac bones, uh, has very, very complex motion. Once again, not, not a whole lot of motion, but it, it is complex motion. And there are studies that suggest that body position actually determine the direction that the uh, sacrum flexes or extends uh, uh, as it sits between the two iliac bones. Overall, uh, movements are in the two degree range and some people it's up to four degrees in three different planes. This nice force diagram actually depicts um, uh, the uh, core muscles. So if you look at the uh, transversus uh, and internal oblique muscles, when they contract, it's almost the equivalent of applying a pelvic binder to the iliac wings. And that actually directs uh, forces uh, across the uh, posterior aspect of the SI joints bilaterally. So that's just uh, something else to keep in mind uh, that suggests that uh, if you have compromised core function, that could uh, add to uh, pelvic instability and, and SI joint pain as well. So pathology, um, as, as orthopedic spine surgeons and neurosurgeons, we, we tend to rely heavily on radiographic uh, signs of pathology. Uh, unfortunately, one of the diagnostic challenges with SI joint dysfunction is that not every patient radiographically will have signs of abnormal findings. And that doesn't necessarily mean that, there's, that the SI joint is still not the pain generator, but just to be aware of this. So ankylosis seldomly occurs in people below the age of uh, 50. 
When you do see it in men, it tends to be more cranial. Uh, in women, it tends to be more caudal, as you can see in the uh, image to the right. Um, so, but unfortunately, not everyone with SI joint pain will have these findings. So that, that just adds to the complexity of your diagnostic algorithm. As we know, um, pain uh, etiology is multifactorial from trauma to arthritis. Arthritis could be degenerative in nature or iatrogenic. Uh, when you consider adjacent segment disease after long fusion constructs, you could have inflammatory conditions that uh, have a predilection to the SI joint, such as ankylosis and spondylitis. Uh, you always have to worry about infection. You always have to worry about the additional instability from hormones that comes from uh, uh, being pregnant. And lastly, tumors also uh, should always be on your differential diagnosis. Once again, I think uh, it's, it's pretty obvious now that uh, most recent studies in the last 10 years have shown that in up to 30% of people that present with lower back pain, the SI joint has been uh, found to be uh, a primary source that drives this. So uh, a quick summary of the anatomy. Uh, the sacral uh, segments do not fuse uh, into one solid bone until sometime in your second decade. The SI joint is primarily comprised of the first three segments. The innervation has now been defined as L5 to L3 uh, with some contribution from L4. It is a synovial joint, a diarthrio joint. The central rotation is somewhere around S2, which is important when you start to consider where you want to place your instrumentation. Not a ton of motion, but sometimes that motion can be uh, pathologic and problematic. The diagnostic challenge uh, lies in the fact that the SI joint mimics uh, pain from uh, degenerative lumbar discs, uh, spinal stenosis from compressed nerves, and also intraarticular hip pathology, and also even in some cases, extraarticular hip pathology. Uh, limb length discrepancy is uh, something that has been reported, but it's not clearly defined uh, in the literature. So there are many physical exam maneuvers that will help clue you in as to the SI joint being the potential source um, and uh, here are just uh, a few of them listed. You, you have your distraction, you have your thigh thrust, your favors, your gain sense maneuvers. And these are provocative maneuvers that have been found to uh, elicit a pain response from uh, the SI joint in people with SI dysfunction. Uh, this depiction just shows how the, the forces applied translate to uh, the SI joint uh, reactive forces. The Fortin finger sign is my favorite. It's very simple. Um, Dr. Fortin um, uh, did some studies on this, and he found that in uh, greater than 70% of people, uh, if you ask them where their, their pain is, they'll point with one finger, and, and it's, it's been pretty uh, reliable. But however, uh, what's disconcerting or, 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 or is that overall, we found that physical exam maneuvers by themselves are not reliable. This is a good study where uh, this was a meta-analysis of several provocative maneuver tests, and they found that despite um, patients having these present, uh, a positive result on sacroiliac joint pain provo provocation test cluster gives the clinician only 35% certainty. So physical exam maneuvers in of themselves are not reliable enough to help uh, hone in your, your true diagnosis of SI dysfunction. You'd have to take that in consideration with other things such as imaging and also a an appropriate treatment algorithm that rules out the more common things such as degenerative disc disease. Uh, with, with any patient who presents with uh, SI joint dysfunction, you, you, you definitely need imaging. Radiographs are typically what we would get first, uh, AP of the pelvis uh, to ensure no obvious bony abnormalities. The CT scan is a, a better study to really truly discern if there's any sacral dysmorphism that could impact uh, your treatment algorithm and also, also affect your surgical uh, plan. Uh, there are more uh, recent studies that are now looking at MRIs to determine if there are any particular edema patterns that could be indicative of some type of SI joint dysfunction, but there's not a whole lot of literature on this, so this is still something that's uh, in the works. Here in the States, um, as we already mentioned, it's not enough to just do the physical exam or to document uh, radiographic images. You have to, or you're required to do diagnostic injections. If you're lucky, sometimes your diagnostic injections may be therapeutic uh, for the patient as well and provide long-term relief, but that's usually not the case. Um, here's a study that looks at uh, whether or not a CT guided versus fluoroscopic guided injections uh, offers benefit one over another. Uh, we found that both injections are uh, actually good at uh, being able to diagnose uh, SI joint uh, dysfunction by uh, having some transient pain improvement. There's no real difference between uh, CT guided versus uh, fluoroscopic, but uh, there are two reliable techniques that uh, we typically employ here in the States. So uh, this is a, 
probably an algorithm that's unique to uh, U.S. payers. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, in India uh, you guys have the same restrictions and uh, issues that we have with uh, trying to get insurance companies to pay for these procedures. But here's what you need uh, uh, to, to have uh, documented. Conservative management, obviously, for 6 to 12 weeks. You have to have at least three of the aforementioned uh, provocative maneuvers that I already showed, although not supported by literature, that insurance companies still require that this be documented. Uh, imaging, they want it, even though we know that imaging studies are usually not uh, conclusive. Uh, and then they do require at least one to two diagnostic injections that demonstrate greater than 70% improvement in pain, even if it's for uh, a short time, six hours, one day, two days, uh, it has to be documented that the patient received greater than 70% improvement in pain. Uh, they feel that the combination of these factors here will uh, help you uh, hone uh, the ideal patient for surgical intervention. Uh, once again, as we all know, uh, appropriate patient selection is uh, crucial to having good outcomes. So in my mind, my treatment algorithm um, uh, in the uh, cases where it's not obvious that the SI joint is uh, the source, um, um, you, you always have to rule out the more common pathology first. Uh, you do your provocative maneuvers, you do your imaging, uh, you do your diagnostic injections. If they get a response from the diagnostic injections, you can wait to see if that is therapeutic, if they're lucky, you can continue conservative management or you can indicate them for a procedure which we'll get into. But if the diagnostic injections are not conclusive, uh, surgery is generally not even an option unless there is some image finding uh, on a CT or X-ray that is, is, is really pushing me in that direction. So as far as uh, surgical options, what are, what are the options available? Uh, open techniques have been described, uh, especially in the trauma uh, setting uh, and also earlier on in the spine literature. But I think in the last 10 to 15 years, most people talking about any surgical intervention for the SI joint are, are really talking minimally invasive techniques. And there's really three, three approaches. You have a direct lateral approach through your gluteus uh, anatomy. You have the uh, posterior oblique approach, which is primarily a posterior approach that tends to avoid the vascularity and, and the muscle damage that you would ordinarily encounter from a lateral approach. And then in some cases, you can have a combined approach where you have a minimally invasive approach posteriorly to the SI joint where you visualize it, you decorticate it, you place a bone graft in there, and then you either come in obliquely or laterally to support that with a fixation device. And we, we'll get into the different types of fixation devices. Intra-op positioning, in our spine uh, world, we tend to do these procedures prone. Um, some trauma surgeons uh, uh, tend to do these supine because they're also addressing some other pelvic pathology. Uh, so there's no uh, right or wrong way to do this, but in my experience, it's primarily prone. And then intra-op, there, there's some key images that help you uh, uh, navigate this uh, type of surgery in a safe manner. And these are are really also dependent on your understanding of the anatomy, but also on your radiology technician. You have to make sure that you have someone who's experienced in the OR to obtain your inlet, your outlet views. Uh, so just to start off with positioning, um, if you're doing this uh, for the first time, obviously uh, you want to ensure that you, you've selected the appropriate patient. Uh, we're, luckily for us, we're never doing this in a traumatic setting. It's typically elective. Uh, you probably want to start off with a lower BMI patient, uh, makes your case much easier. Uh, some of the issues to think about when it comes to position, if you're going to do a prone, the issue with the Jackson table uh, is that the bolsters sometimes can distort the anatomy. The bolsters can also uh, obscure your visualization with your uh, fluoroscopic imaging. So we tend to recommend a flat top table uh, with the patient on some uh, mild, uh, small rolls beneath the pelvis and uh, underneath the chest as well. So here's where the imaging is, is crucial. Uh, we already mentioned that you're going to need AP, lateral, inlet, outlets, uh, you want to ensure that on your lateral image, you have uh, a true lateral. Uh, you want to ensure that your sacral ala density lines are one and that there's no significant parallax because uh, if this is off, your start point for your first uh, uh, pin or your dowel or your screw may be off and, and, and could further compromise the L5 nerve as it comes out of the foramen and lays anteriorly uh, alongside that uh, sacral ala. Uh, the inlet projection uh, is crucial for the case uh, as you place your uh, implants from uh, iliac to sacral uh, zones, you wanna ensure that uh, your trajectory is appropriate so you avoid uh, contents in the uh, pelvis, including the bladder and some uh, obviously uh, dangerous blood vessels. Your outlet uh, image here is really to help you guide where you place your devices relative to the sacral foramen to ensure that there's no damage to uh, uh, sacral nerves. 
Biogas uh, clearly can be a problem and um, we don't typically do a bio prep. Uh, and luckily, uh, in my experience uh, of having done a few cases, I, I have not had to abort for biogas, but I can potentially see this as being a problem. It's one of those cases where if you don't have adequate imaging, you really should not push the envelope. You, you probably should just cancel the case or postpone the case. Or if you have navigation at your disposal, that would be uh, the alternative. And so uh, benefits of navigation, uh, if you have that, obviously less radiation uh, over time. Um, um, with the navigation that primarily CT based, so if there's any sacral dysmorphism or aberrant anatomy, you're, it's readily uh, visible. You don't have to deal with the bowel gas and, and necessarily body habitus issues when it comes to fluoroscopy. Uh, limitations of this will be cost. Not every institution can afford navigation. So most people do train and start these cases uh, with simple uh, uh, C-arm technology. It's an MIS case, pin, pin placement and pin management is, is, is critical. Uh, we talked about the views that are essential to get this done. Um, uh, when it comes to pin management, your soft tissue cannula and protectors are important because when you do the lateral base procedures, if your cannula is not flush on the iliac bone, when you start to ream or drill across, you can grab fibers of the uh, gluteus maximus or gluteus medius and that also uh, drives bleeding and post-op hematoma. But more importantly, you, you don't wanna grab branches of the superior gluteal artery. And I've seen uh, cases where that has happened. Um, and that, that, that presents a challenge. If the patient has a large body habitus and you, and you have a bleeder that, that has retracted and you can't see, you're, you're stuck with two options. Either you have to create a very large incision to go find that bleeder, which is very difficult to do uh, when they have large uh, uh, muscles or a patient then has to take a trip to the inter interventional radiology for a coiling procedure. Uh, there are a variety of implants available. Uh, the two main uh, types are screw-based technology and uh, uh, these uh, titanium uh, dowels uh, that go across the SI joint. Uh, uh, it's really dealer's choice per the surgeon, what you feel comfortable with. There have been some studies that look at the different implants and there's no difference in outcomes, uh, implant to implant. Uh, the good news is that regardless of what you use, most patients tend to do well uh, post-op. Uh, the direction a lot of our vendors and companies are taking is uh, paying, paying special attention to uh, surface topography. Um, depending on uh, how porous the implant is, you can affect you can affect bony ingrowth and on growth onto the implant, and that also helps to achieve your uh, fusion. I think I think it's well known that the initial uh, thing you achieve when you do the procedure is stability first across the SI joint. The fusion doesn't happen until months later. I'm not aware of anyone using BMP with these, uh, and, and if you did, it'll be off-label. Uh, most people just decorticate uh, with the drills, uh, put the implants across, they get the initial mechanical stability, and then based on the topography of the implant and, uh, and the host uh, conditions, the bony ingrowth and ungrowth occurs over time. Same thing, screw-based technology, um, fenestrated screws. Uh, there have been some suggestions of some people uh, using a cement augmentation. That is not common. Uh, as we know, cement extravasation can present with other problems. So uh, once again, here's a quick study uh, by Klaus et al. looking at uh, implant choices. No real difference between implants, uh, bone dowels versus uh, traditional uh, screw fixation techniques. Uh, all patients show significant improvement in PROMS of six months. The uh, Overall, the, the SI joint continues to remain a significant challenge because there are many pitfalls that are associated with uh, the uh, SI joint dysfunction, everything from uh, diagnostic uh, to imaging to surgical technique. Uh, it's, a, it's pretty uh, much a polarizing uh, technique. I think 15 years ago, the only people who were doing SI joint fusions were for people who had had long fusions to the sacrum uh, and had uh, adjacent segment uh, problems. I think we're now starting to push the envelope in realizing that there's some people who don't necessarily have, who've never had a, a spinal fusions, but do still have a SI joint dysfunction that could benefit from the uh, intervention. Uh, here's a, 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 a depiction of sacral dysmorphism, which I think is very uh, critical, uh, not only in your diagnostic uh, uh, algorithm, but also in treatment, because if you have the presence of any aberrant uh, sacral anatomy, that could affect how you uh, position your implants. There's not a whole lot of real estate as far as how many implants you can get across the SI joint. Um, and so if you have the presence of any uh, sacral abnormalities, you wanna know that ahead of time because that could limit the number of uh, implants you can put across the joint and, uh, and that also limits your mechanical stability of the joint. 
Uh, inlet outlet views we already alluded to are, are crucial for uh, fluoroscopic uh, technique. The image on the top left shows the appropriate start point for your first implant. Hello. Which is, yes. I'm sorry, the implant, uh, the image on the top left shows the appropriate start point for your first implant, which is always behind that sacral ala density line to avoid the L5 nerve root. And so uh, most common complications described in the literature that are, uh, are wound drainage, uh, usually less than 10%. Uh, uh, nerve injury L5 is the most common nerve. And in fact, is the only nerve that I've seen described in the literature as being injured with this um, as far as permanent damage. Uh, there've been some uh, reports of sacral uh, injury, sacral nerve injuries, but those are usually transient and, and do improve. Vascular injury is typically a branch of the superior gluteal artery and not necessarily the, the main trunk itself. And that's either obtained uh, controlled with local uh, means uh, or uh, to interventional radiology for embolization or coiling. Pseudoarthrosis, the CT scans are not always conclusive. I've, I've seen it, uh, patients who have had SI joint fusions performed years ago, and then I go take the patient back to the operating room to attempt to take out the implant because the CT showed a questionable halo, and those implants were well fixed and were, were not able to come out. So the pseudoarthrosis diagnosis uh, remains challenging, uh, even though we do uh, say that it, traditionally, if you see a halo around the implant, it's suggestive of loosening. That's not always the case with these particular implants. So overall, when you look at outcomes, non op versus operative, um, uh, here's a nice uh, randomized uh, control study by Poly et al. That, that demonstrates that patients who um, are exposed to operative intervention generally do better than patients who are treated non op. When you look at uh, studies looking at open technique versus MIS, uh, I think it's clear cut that uh, the MIS technique is uh, the way to go. The pain relief is better. The blood loss and length of stay are also less in the MIS groups. Uh, here's a lit review uh, by Martin et al. Uh, looking at uh, several studies that, that once again show that uh, fusion is, is definitely better than a non-op uh, treatment for people who feel conservative management. One year results are similar. Long-term data, there's, uh, there's one study that, that, that talks about five-year data where the VAS and uh, ODI scores were maintained at five years uh, uh, when compared to uh, 12 months post-op, and that was promising. Uh, downside to the study was, was only 21 patients, uh, but still that's uh, one of the most recent ones for long-term data. I think uh, with future directions uh, for, for this pathology, which uh, remains polarizing and, and challenging, I think we need more accurate diagnostics. Um, uh, when you look at comparing uh, SI stabilization techniques, um, we, we're not clear whether or not the prone position versus supine position makes a difference. Um, we don't really have many studies that look at navigation versus floor based uh, uh, outcomes. And then studying the downstream effects of uh, SI fusion on more cephalad lumbar levels. So if, for example, if you operate on someone who's never had spine, uh, lumbar spine surgery, what are you doing to the L5S1 disc, the L4-5 disc as it pertains to adjacent segment disease? Uh, there's there are gonna be many studies uh, looking at that in the very near future. So special considerations, um, you know, the SI joint, uh, obviously you have uh, left and right joints. Uh, there's some people that worry that uh, if you're going to fuse one, uh, is that a predictor for future contralateral fusion? I think if you extrapolate data from the trauma population and people who've, who've sustained traumatic injuries to their SI joints unilateral, who had some type of fixation performed, there's not a whole lot of data that suggests that those same people years later need their right sides uh, addressed because of any type of adjacent segment degeneration. So I think that's a ripe area for uh, future um, uh, research. And then when the pain uh, etiology is multifactorial and they have evidence of pathology in the lumbar spine and the SI joint, uh, and maybe even the hip joint, I think we, we would need to uh, develop algorithms to figure out which uh, pathology to address first, similar to what we're doing now with hip um, arthritis and uh, lumbar spine disease. So a quick presentation on a, on a 63 year old female that I saw, uh, she had managed conservatively for uh, over four or five years uh, with therapy, activity modification. She had had at least two image guided SI joint injections with more than 70% improvement in symptoms. Uh, the MRI of the lumbar spine was not really, uh, didn't really show any significant uh, pathology that was worth addressing surgically. So we uh, ended up indicating her for uh, SI fusion. Um, example of uh, some of the things that she had uh, undergone prior to surgery. This was her anatomy. Uh, and so uh, in this case, uh, which is rare, she actually had x-ray evidence of SI 
uh, degeneration, as you can see the, the bony osteophyte uh, there. If you look at the lateral, you'd be, uh, you'd be correct to assume that there's some type of sacral dysmorphism going on here. There's some type of transitional anatomy. And that's a, uh, a very important to know uh, prior to going into surgery. And uh, once again, it really has to do with the start point. So on the left image is what the normal sacral ala density line should look like and where your initial start point should be. But if I, if I extrapolate her image to what that left image should be, um, and I put that star where my first implant should be, I would have had a major problem with this particular surgery. And, and the CT scan really tells the picture, or also the MRI. Uh, she had a transitional anatomy, and where I thought the first uh, implant would go, on that top right-hand corner, you can actually see that there's a devoid of bone there. So that would have been a mistake to actually start my first implant there. Uh, the bottom image shows um, where the appropriate start point would be, which is actually lower than where I initially would start my first implant. So what I have not recognized that uh, pre-op, uh, attempted to uh, instrument this uh, segment, I probably would have hit the L5 nerve root or even worse, one of those blood vessels. So once again, uh, this just highlights how sacral dysmorphism, transitional anatomy can affect your, your outcomes. We ended up only having enough real estate to do two implants across the, the joint. And uh, as you can see depicted in the image, uh, she, she did great. Um, majority of her pain was improved uh, six weeks. She's only about six, seven weeks out. So I still need uh, more long-term data on her. But uh, similar to my other patients, I would say, I expect her to, to maintain the improvement as she's already seen. So in summary, SI joint dysfunction, up to 30% of uh, chronic lower back pain um, uh, is potentially uh, uh, due to uh, SI uh, dysfunction. Uh, with anatomy and technique, always be on the watch out for sacral dysmorphism. Um, uh, in, if you do not have navigation at your facility and you're using traditional C-arm, uh, just be aware of bowel gas, uh, body habits, BMI. Uh, if you can afford navigation or if your institution has it, uh, you, may, you may want to get trained on that. Uh, the primary things to avoid would be the L5 nerve root and uh, branches of the superior, superior gluteal artery. And that, that really is uh, pain management and, and, and making sure that your cannula is flush on the, uh, on the bone. Uh, I think most people who are doing this, once again, are doing this MIS. Uh, the outcomes are better than with traditional open surgery. And uh, that's, that's what I have. Happy to take any questions. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Bolabo, for the excellent talk. Any, any questions here in the front of the panel? Yeah, uh, Dr. Bolago, uh, I had a question on, uh, I mean, uh, many a times when we have these kind of patients, uh, we need to do a psychological assessment on them as well uh, to know whether they will benefit actually from this because they, it could, uh, you know, there could be other causes for the pain as well. Uh, do you do that uh, routinely when you choose these patients? Absolutely. Um, so the, the, every patient that I see who presents with SI joint dysfunction uh, as a referral, if, if, even if they have had an MRI two, three years ago, I always repeat the MRI to ensure that there's no new pathology that uh, is mimicking the uh, pain distribution. Because once again, the pain, the pain patterns are very similar between SI uh, dysfunction, lumbar degenerative disease, and lumbar radiculopathy. People will tell you they have that pain in the uh, piriformis area that sometimes radiates to the groin, that sometimes radiates to the thigh. So you really have to do a good job of ruling out the uh, uh, the more common causes of pain. So degenerative disc disease. And sometimes I will, I will even get a, a hip MRI to ensure that I'm ruling that out before I commit them to uh, SI joint fusion surgery. Yeah. Balabo, I have one question. Yep. Uh, suppose we do a long segment fusion from D10 to uh, pelvis, I mean, from S2 uh, iliac fixation. So does that uh, put the patient at risk of SI joint pain or what is, what is your call on that? No, so that's a, that's a great question. Some companies are now starting to uh, develop um, a technique where when you do that long fusion T10 to the uh, pelvis or your S2 AI screws, you can actually augment your S2 AI screws with a bone dowel in the same trajectory as the uh, S2 AI screw. And that provides additional fixation. Some people are of the thought that that one screw across the SI joint is not protective for the potential uh, degeneration that could occur. Uh, but, and so they, they, they do recommend that if you're gonna do a long fusion, that maybe you should be fusing the SI joints at the same time. Um, traditionally, it's been in the past that if you did the long fusion, 
with or without S2 AI screws, you would wait. And if they develop SI joint problems a year later, then you would take them back and do the fusion. Uh, but there, there, there are few surgeons across the country who are recommending that you may just want to consider uh, prophylactically fusing the SI joint or augmenting your S2 AI screw at the same time of your index procedure. So once you put the S2 uh, ILX screw, do you have enough space to put another spacer? Because the spacer which you had showed is, is a big, it's a big device. So do you have enough space to put another one? Yes, yes, you do, and uh, it's uh, it's typically above. So wherever your S2 AI screw goes, uh, the the bone dowel that goes uh, next to it is typically cephalat to it, and that, there's not a whole lot of real estate in here. And you also want to ensure that you're not violating the sciatic notch. So most times people right. will put more cephalat. All right, thank you, Golabo. Uh, Dr. Uh, Golabo, is there any uh, problem with doing a unilateral fusion? Do you find that uh, it causes further degeneration of the other side? or uh, pain on the other side? That's, it's a great question. And I, I think if you look at trauma literature and you look at how the pelvic functions, people feel like the pelvic anatomy is similar to a pretzel where one force on one side affects the contralateral side. We do not have any research yet to, to suggest that fusing one side uh, predisposes the patient to need an effusion on the contralateral side. I've certainly seen uh, in my uh, prior practice before coming back to HSS, people who ended up having bilateral SI joint uh, fusions over the course of three years, but we don't have enough data to support uh, if that's gonna be uh, what we recommend or if we should be prophylactically doing the other side. So no, the, the potential is, is that adjacent segment degeneration can occur, but if you look at how things happen, you have the spine in the middle. So if you're fusing the left SI joint and the lumbar spine has never been fused, we don't know if the forces are directly transmitted to the lumbar spine first, L5-S1 disc space, or to the contralateral unfused right uh, uh, SI joint. So that's where future uh, research is really going to be directed at looking at the patterns, uh, and, and, and this will help guide our patients preoperatively. Yeah, can I ask a question? Uh, so is there any evidence of uh, you know fusing the SI joint in uh, ankylosing spondylitis, spondylitis, seronegative spondyloarthropathy who have severe you know, SI joint pain? No, so the the research there's a the, the research is not solid. It's not strong on that. But the, the that patient that presentation I just gave that lady actually had ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, anecdotally, I can tell you they get better. Um, and, and I'm not sure uh, if the inflammatory um, issues that, are, that have to do with the autoimmune disease uh, uh, compound the fact that the uh, the there's micro motion about the SI joint that causes additional inflammation. Uh, I, I don't think it's well defined, but what we do know that is that if you if you have enough implants to limit that uh, micro motion that's uh, pathologic, uh, people tend to do better with that. Uh, but I think the research is just not strong enough yet. Dr. Amit Sharma, your question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, a big hello to Dr. Girardi, Dr. Sama, and Dr. Fentini. Um, good to be uh, good to see you all. Uh, my question is. Uh, uh, so, uh, do, did you ever have to uh, fuse an SI joint after a long segment, uh, you know, like lumbar sacral fusion, because the sacroiliac joint got secondarily affected, uh, like it got uh, secondarily degenerated after a long segment lumbar sacral fusion? Yes. Um, in fact, that's the most common reason the SI joint is fused in America currently, and and that's been the most common reason because it's easy to prove that that is the pain generator. As long as you've ruled out pseudoarthrosis of your long fusion, um, that's usually the next thing that goes is the SI joint. And a lot of times, once they've had a long fusion, you will see evidence of degenerative changes in the joint on imaging studies. And that's the easiest indication. I think uh, the, the challenge comes in people who have not had long fusions and who don't have MRI-based uh, lumbar pathology or hip pathology uh, and yet have SI pain. That's where the challenge is. But historically in America, that's been the easiest case to get approved uh, and, and performed as far as insurance uh, companies would even pay for. It's just that now we're pushing the envelope as to uh, what other people have uh, SI pain and don't necessarily have uh, lumbar pathology. So in these cases, because we have a long liver arm on one side, lumbar sacral, the fuse segment, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, we have just, you know, like uh, iliac wings. So uh, are there more chances of uh, non-unions? No, it's not, it's not that there's more, there's not, it's, not, it's not that there's a higher incidence of non-unions. I think, I think you have to give your lung fusion a chance. Um, I'm, not, I'm not of the camp that you prophylactically have to do more work. 
Um, there, there, there's still a lot of patients who've had long fusions and don't have SI related pain. And just because you see uh, radiographic changes uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they have pathology. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm more of the camp that if you're gonna do a long fusion, you do it and then wait and see if the patient develops an issue two, three, four, five years down the road, you can always go back and, and augment that. I don't know if that Thank answers you. your question. Thank you, Dr. Balago. I think we'll uh, go ahead with our uh, program. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Arvind Kulkarni, who's a senior member of uh, the Bombay Spine Society and a, a consultant spine surgeon here at Bombay Hospital to share his uh, thoughts on the philosophy of minimally invasive spine surgery. Yeah, thank you. At the outset, uh... Thank you. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ayu Sharma, uh, Dr. Abhijit Pawar, uh, the BSS for this uh, great invitation. I'm uh, highly obliged. Uh, I would like to uh, congratulate Ayush for putting up uh, this great show. I would uh, I would suggest and uh, you know advise the delegates to extract the best that they can from the hard work that uh, Dr. Ayush and his team has put together for the next uh, two days. So, uh, moving ahead. So, this is a, I'll start with a few examples. So, this is a 65-year-old lady who is a foot soldier. She has severe claudication pain and she has a baggage of uh, comorbidities. She's extremely obese and she's osteoporotic and uh, her activities are totally limited by this uh, claudication pain and she's on heavy medication. So we want to get rid of her pain without causing any post-operative mor uh, you know, mor morbidity in her, uh, which is expected uh, you know, uh, in a patient with the kind of uh, picture she has in terms of medical complications as well as uh, you know, uh, wound healing complications. So this is what we did. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'd have had to do a long uh, uh, segment decompression. So using a single incision, we could decompress all the three levels. So that is the beauty of uh, minimal access spine surgery. So this would be about you know ten to twelve centimeter long incision, which was uh, 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 which was not utilized, and we could uh, achieve our goals with uh, with a minimal access small uh, incision, and. Uh, so that is possible uh, with the uh, principles and philosophy of uh, minimal access surgery by just you know tilting the tubes uh, in the right trajectory with a single incision so this is another example of another lady with a mountain of comorbidities she underwent laminectomy a destructive uh, laminectomy about 5 years back following which she had a very stormy post-operative period in short term as well as long term. She couldn't walk after a few days. The wound healed after two years, after, sorry, after two months. That also, you know, after repeated debridements and the help of a plastic surgeon. So if, you know, she ended up with this kind of, uh, you know, gruesome instability, which needed to be addressed to make her get up and walk. And uh, the only option was to to use minimal access here, uh, you know, one would be scared, any surgeon would be scared to go through the same particular incision. But by virtue of its uh, nature, uh, we use a paraspinal approach when we do a minimal access still if So using small little incisions, which you can see here, we could achieve the goal of, uh, you know, stabilizing her L4-5. And uh, she went up and walked happily smiling in, the, you know, in a matter of two to three days. So that is the beauty of uh, uh, MIS. So it is a great, great uh, you know, rescue uh, uh, strategy uh, in failed backs of uh, such kind. Uh, this is another uh, uh, example of a very elderly gentleman with ankylosing spondylitis uh, who had severe comorbidities with an ejection fraction of 15%. So he had a three column uh, injury as you see here all the three columns are fractured and otherwise you would have suggested a long segment fusion uh, in a patient with a zero negative spondyloarthropathy and we took a chance and just did a vertebroplasty here because it was undisplaced and you know with just you know 15 uh, 1.5 to 2 cc of cement uh, done percutaneously we could make him stand up and walk following which which we we got further confidence and treated two 
such patients similarly and made them walk the very uh, same day after the procedure. So another gentleman who had severe neck pain, which was nocturnal in nature, he had this C5-6 uh, you know, superior end plate, uh, osteodosteoma close to the spinal cord at the superior end plate. Uh, uh, you know, he came to us, he presented to us with, uh, with nocturnal pain. As I said, a convention would, conventionally one would you know, do a, 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 a discrectomy, uh, superior end plate, superior uh, 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 you know, partial corpectomy of C6, uh, C6 uh, superior end plate and do an anterior reconstruction with, uh, you know, with a cage, a bone, cage filled with bone graft and plate. Uh, so, you know, we have this uh, increasing momentum happening uh, in the direction of motion preservation surgery. Of course, disc replacement was not not an option in this particular case. So, the goal was to excise this particular uh, lesion without uh, causing any morbidity. That was like finding a needle in a haystack. We had to go in the right direction at the right depth in the right trajectory so as to not cause any collateral damage. So that was again possible using navigation which is a co-accomplice of minimal access surgery. So this was uh, very well achieved and using this small you know, hole we could find the trajectory and uh, pull the lesion out. And this is the post-operative CT immediate. And this is after one year where the entire burrow is filled with bone. So this is like targeting, you know, it is a, a, a surgical strike, which is hitting the, the target alone without causing any collateral damage. And this is what you see is post-operative uh, movement and post-operative MRI, which shows no further degeneration of that particular disc. So, if you see all these examples, what you can uh, appreciate is the goal of surgery remains the same. What has changed is from what is to be done to how is it to be done. So, that is the beauty of minimal access. So, when you talk of open surgery, so there are some uh, issues here. So, you're doing carpet bombing. So, most of the lesions that we treat in spine are focal in nature, whether it's a disc herniation, whether it is stenosis, whether it is instability, they're pinpointed, uh, you know, focal lesions. So when you do this kind of a carpet bombing just to you know get access to in order to get access to that particular pathology, we forget that we are doing a lot of collateral damage, which can result in you know instabilities, wound healing issues, which lead to you know large big dead spaces leading to wound infections. Uh, you know the healing takes time, which is associated with longer hospital stays and consequences, medical as well as surgical consequences related to the same. So the philosophy of MIS is such that, you know, as I said, this is a focused approach. It is a precision surgery with minimal collateral damage. Again, because there are small little incisions done through small tunnels, which, you know, which close once the, uh, uh, you know, uh, objective is achieved. Wound healing is not a problem in this particular, uh, with this kind of uh, incisions, with these kind of approaches. Again, which, which mean, which translate into low wound infection rates and again, reduced duration of hospital stay and early uh, return to work. So the philosophy of principle, uh, philosophy and principles of MIS, I would like to discuss in these uh, particular uh, uh, steps and parameters that we routinely use when we do an open spine surgery. So when it comes to incision, you know, localization is half the work done and it is the, the key to achieve your objectives. With regards to localization, on one hand, a perfect localization, uh, you know, is the key to success and the, a perfect localization limits the size of your incision. So it is very important that your localization is absolute in the right, uh, at the right spot in the, with, the, with the right, trajectory in your mind. Again, how does it, this help? This does help in terms of wound healing because, you know, these wounds, as I said, because your localization is uh, such that the incisions are small, they don't come in the way of wound healing. So when you do an open surgery and you close, you know, the whole thing closes like a, you know, like a roof of a tent. So the whole thing balloons up and you get an ugly cleavage, uh, you know, this cleavage is lost and you can see an ugly scar. And again, when you're, so suppose this patient such as this has skin lesions on his back, okay, which will have, which will be associated with wound healing problems. You can compare, you know, a long incision done through this particular lesion versus a small incision. Here you will be not bothered also about the healing. It's going to heal on its own. So that is the beauty of, uh, you know, doing through these long incisions. As I said, 
localization is the key and that guides your incision so it is very relevant that you customize your localization and your incision thereby uh, with relation to the procedures that you are going to perform and this also varies from patient to patient from uh, level to level from race to race etc so that is very important that you customize your localization based on the dimensions of the patient again the goal of a surgeon you know is to have a successful career and to have a comfortable living so in indian terms it is roti kapda makan probably you know a luxury car but most importantly it is to never perform a long level surgery so wrong level surgery one if one perform the wrong level surgery you will be hesitant to you know perform the next surgery in your life so this is something which uh, uh, which uh, is probably impossible when you do it, when you are a minimal access surgeon because this is totally image guided surgery so especially when it comes to the tubular retractors or the endoscopes you know right from the time you pass the guide wire till your tube is docked your focus is on that particular level so it is very uh, uh, close to impossible to do a wrong level uh, spine surgery if you do if you are an mis surgeon so uh, that's one of the uh, basic philosophies of mis again whether it is the, the size of a, even a micro discectomy for example the incision of micro discectomy scar uh, varies from patient to patient depending upon the size of the patient but here when it comes to you know tubular surgery or endoscopic surgery whether it is a you know laurel or a hardy the size of the incision remains the same it relates only to the size or diameter of the tube that you are going to use to accomplish your goals again it's as i said it's a big boon uh, in obese patients such as these where wound healing is a big problem uh when it comes to the principles of exposure uh, unfortunately unlike or uh, unless you are doing an anterior surgery unlike our uh, colleagues who do pelvic and abdominal laparoscopic surgery we don't have the uh, the, uh, the the leisure of uh, an open cavity uh, convenience of an open cavity so we the philosophy of mis is such that you need to create an open cavity temporarily that is done using dilators you pass a series of dilators that open up the uh, plane between the muscular fibers and then you insert your port and this is a temporary cavity that you we create to accomplish your goals the good thing is you know once this comes out once the tube comes out uh, the 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 muscle fibers oppose and the dead space is closed so this again has various benefits so this is a temporary cavity as i said so there is minimal dead space when you remove the tube so the positives of this are you know if there is a csf lake that is contained within this dead space it doesn't encourage collection so most of the times you know 99% of the times we just close the incision without being bothered about the csf leaks if once one experiences one when you are doing your surgery and you can have a good night sleep unless unlike a situation where you have done the open surgery and you know you know, attempted a closure of these particular leaks again hematoma collection is not an issue thereby again translating into low infection rate uh, so many a times you don't even use a suction drain when you are doing a minimal access to leave that is because the exposure is such that it hardly leaves any dead space so as i said you know uh, dural tears are very compromise you know very forgiving when it comes to minimal access surgery because there is no space for the csf to collect and in terms of infection you know the wider the exposure the higher the the possibility of uh, the higher the surface area the higher the possibility of you know exposure to pathogens so if you see a com you know a comparative uh, picture of uh, mis for an open surgery it's a, a you know inverted cone versus an open cone where the exposure to bacterial path bacteria pathogens is wider uh, in open spine surgery that that perhaps uh, you know um, helps in minimizing uh, you know surgical site infections when it comes to mis again uh, the economic implications of post operative infections as we all know are very very high uh, they almost close 1.5 times the the cost of uh, you know the cost of uh, the original primary index surgery again uh, the principles of retraction this is you don't need retractors here it is inherent in the technique the tube itself protects you and uh, from the from the muscle creep from the bleeding from the uh, from the sides 
uh, you can, you know, unlike what is generally thought, these tubes, uh, uh, you know, the, it, it depends on how well you can use your the tubes at your disposal. You can, you know, twist and turn them, you can push them up, you can push them down, you can angulate them medially, laterally, superiorly, inferiorly. As I showed in the first example, you can do 3-3 level decompress with one small incision. So it is how uh, you know good you are in using these particular tubes to at your disposal. Again, you need to have uh, so here, unlike you know open surgery where your vision is vertically on the field, here you need to. Uh, uh, you, it's very important that you have uh, modular tables which is mobile in all planes because you are using uh, various angles and various trajectories to accomplish your goal without causing a uh, soft tissue and uh, bony uh, morbidity osseous morbidity and when it comes to decompression uh, it's uh, endoscope microscope which help in getting your magnification right and you getting your illumination right and the various terms that you learn afresh when you start doing minimal access is terms like you know over the top decompression indirect decompression contralateral decompression which you're not paid heed to when you've been doing minimal access surgery so here it's called over the top decompression so there is stenosis you use your tube vertically to do a ipsilateral decompression then go on the opposite side by drilling the base of the spinous process and the inner cortex of the opposite lamina to get across from one side to the other side to accomplish your decompression, which is complete, as seen here. So you're going opposite on the opposite side underneath the spinous process, underneath the lamina of the opposite side. So this is called contralateral decompression or over-the-top decompression. And it is it is not restricted in any particular uh, dimensions of stenosis. Even the most severe of you know stenosis can be uh, decompressed using this particular technique. So this is a pre-operative you know stenosis, uh, axial section of a stenotic patient, and you can see this uh, you know tubular footprint through which you know ipsi as well as contralateral decompression was performed uh, using a you know 18 millimeter tubular retractor. Again, in situations such as these where there are kissing facets, especially at the higher upper lumbar roots, upper lumbar levels, uh, you know, it is it is impossible to do a, you know, ipsilateral foraminotomy without compromising on the, you know, step, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the facet uh, integrity. So these are the situations, again, terms like this, which is like contralateral approach, uh, contralateral decompression come of use. So here you're going from the opposite side and drilling the base of uh, the, the inner cortex of the opposite side and then getting access to that particular lesion. So thereby you're not compromising much on your ipsilateral facet as well as the contralateral facet. So this is the way you start thinking when you start doing MIS. Again, uh, as was discussed in the first talk, you know, indirect decompression is something which, uh, which is again uh, a manifestation of minimal access uh, surgery, a realization of minimal access surgery, uh, wherein you know you can jack up uh, the disc space, basically use ligament to access to your benefit to accomplish uh, you know decompression uh, with minimal access. Again, when you start thinking small, you start thinking smaller and smaller. So when you have a migrated disc with no disc component at the level of the disc, you don't need to start your you know, laminotomy right from the, uh, the lower margin of the lamina. You go right on the target using these tubes and you know accomplish your discectomy uh, <clears throat> without compromising on either the flavum stabil stability of the flavum because you are above the attachment of the flavum or uh, uh, nor are you excising uh, uh, the unnecessary uh, laminar ridge, which is not involved in the pathology. So this is a, a hole which is drilled through the lamina through which uh, discectomy uh, is accomplished. So when when you start thinking small, you know. So of course, in a degenerative lysis which is unstable, such as this where you have this vacuum phenomena, there is a collapse, this space, uh, you do need to do a fusion, but there are situations where, you know, the disc is dried up, the facets are all dried up, it is a burnt out, uh, you know, degenerative pathology, the patient just has leg pain, 
you know as has uh, very stable characters uh, uh, characteristics on the on the mri and x rays doesn't have axial back pain you can just get away with uh, decompression alone you know when you start thinking small you start thinking smaller and smaller and you try to conserve these patients with minimal access surgery so uh, many patients who do with degenerative spondylolisthesis can be just uh, decompressed without uh, fusing them and degenerative scoliosis is a big conundrum Dr. Kulkarni, we've lost you, I think. I think he lost the connection, the internet connection, he lost his connection. Yeah. While he's coming on, uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. S.K. Srivastava uh, if he's around, uh, or Dr. Vishal Peshativar. Um, Dr. Uh, Arvind Kulkarni talked about uh, uh, these... Uh, uh, and spawn patients uh, with uh, with a fracture, which we normally think about having a long segment uh, stabilization in these patients, uh, but he showed uh, that he is doing a vertebroplasty in these patients and uh, uh, without having any doing any stabilization. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Or is he only talking about patients who have only that anterior column defect and maybe the posterior column is intact? Uh, Can I answer this? Uh, actually. Uh... It all, uh, you know, uh, depends upon the what is the pathology and for due to which the patient is uh, having the symptoms. If it is just a, uh, you know, minimal pain in encouraging spondylitis, you know, filling up the pain generator might help. But if it is instability, then I think, you know, short segment fixation is not that good unless you give extra protection because it is well known fact that there is a very long liver arm. And there are very high chance of failure. So it is like a fracture of the shaft of femur. Okay, so unless you have multiple purchase, the chances of failure is there. And I think that is an important uh, point one should keep in mind when you are treating a case of, uh, you know, uh, ankylosing spondylitis and there is a fracture and patient has come to you with uh, signs and symptoms. Many a times they have neurological deficit also. Now, this is an acute setup. Sometimes the patient comes with the Anderson lesion. You know, there is a gap. There is no total instability, but patient has Anderson lesion. It is painful. In such situation, if it is stable, even the short segment fixation, you might uh, get away with that. Otherwise, a clear-cut fracture, three-column injury, one should never try to do short segment fixation. I agree totally. In that patient, the ejection fraction was 15% and probably wouldn't have survived a long stability, uh, stabilization. So it was probably used as a salvage procedure, but I would not recommend that as a standard treatment for any fracture in antispons. Dr. Srivastava just mentioned the long liver arms that act at the fracture site. It's better to fix it long if you have to get it. Uh, Vishal, have you come across any uh, patients of uh, with Anderson lesion, uh, patients with angst font having Anderson lesion? Plenty of them. I think all of us see them all the time. Uh, is it on, always only uh, limited to the anterior uh, aspect or other posterior elements? By the time they come to you, they are three column defects, and most of them come with uh, pain being there for quite some time and having deficit, at least in our country scenario. Most of them, I, I've rarely seen somebody come with an injury that has not had a deficit. Majority of them come with a deficit. But what we, the only thing different now, what we are doing is we no longer decompress. We just stabilize and that's sufficient. Now, actually here, I would like to add, but if the patient has Anderson lesion, there is a host response, body response to stabilize that. So you'll find there's a lot of host bone form there to stabilize that. You'll find sclerosis, new bone formation, posterior element is also involved. So in those situations when CT clearly shows that there is a compression and patient has deficit, I think there is a role of decompression also. So my take on this is usually uh, this patient's, uh, the deficit is because that's the only point of movement. And like Dr. Shivasu said, you see a lot of osteophytic uh, potential there. So it's like what you treat on horses who, or an elephant foot non-union, as it was classified that time, 
uh, as non-unions where there were stability is a problem. So if you stabilize, they tend to become uh, uh, pain-free. Also, once you're stabilized, the movement stops. These osteophytes are not going to grow into the canal. Usually they are on the anterior part of the uh, uh, vertebral column. The posterior half does not show that. Of course, if you see a posterior half uh, uh, osteophyte, then you've got to decompress that area. But uh, fortunately, most of the cases come across, there's an anterior osteophyte. I just do a percutaneous fixation, and that seems to be right. And we are now writing a paper on that. We've got sufficient... Without knowledge. a fusion. Dr. Kulkarni is back, I think. You can start. Yeah. yeah. Can I share my screen? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead and start from where we lost you. So can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. We can see your screen. Yeah. Go ahead from where we lost you. Are you hearing me? Voice is slightly breaking. I think your net is unstable. Your is unstable. Your voice is cracking. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah. your net is unstable, I guess. Your voice is cracking in between. So, this is the case of uh, degenerative uh, stenosis, degenerative scoliosis with stenosis uh, selectively at one level. It is at L45. Your network is not good. I think you should reconnect with a different. Yeah, please, please try. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. But your yeah. network signal is very poor, so you lose it. You lose it, it in between. The signal of your network shows red, red, red. Let me know if you can't hear. How about now? It's, yeah, yeah. Shaky. it's, it's better now. Go ahead. It's better. Go ahead. But go ahead. Yes. So yeah. here, you know, you go from the convex side, which, uh, as the last speaker was saying, has a high, a bigger amount of real estate. That is the con. Convex, uh, concave side uh, compared to the convex side compared to the concave side. So had, that has more bone. So you go from that particular side and uh, do a opposite side decompression uh, to decompress the lateral recess on the opposite side. So you're basically going from the convex side to the concave side and excising and uh, decompressing the lateral recess of the opposite side. So I'll uh, go past this particular video. This will basically show uh, contralateral decompression to de which will decompress the lateral axis on lateral recess on the opposite side. So you can see the nerve root on the opposite side, the lateral recess on the opposite side. So when it comes to the principle of instrumentation uh, for the delegates, basically we depend in in open spine surgery on pe mainly percutaneous pe you know on per pedicle screw rod fixation so when it comes to mis since the spine is not visible to you it's uh, based on uh, you know a guide wire based technique so we use percutaneous pedicle screws and uh, apply this rod using various techniques of different kinds uh, based on the uh, you know companies that support that particular system so these are all cannulated screws because these run on guide wires. Again, uh, here uh, you either use a CM where you're exposed to radiation or you buy a high-end machine such as a navigation or a robotics and uh, use the uh, put insert these screws here with minimal uh, radiation exposure. Again, uh, here, unlike open spine surgery, where we are uh, used to doing, you know, uh, intertransverse fusion or postulatal fusions, this is a challenge when it comes to MIS. So here he, we heavily depend on interbody fusion. So this is a basic difference in the philosophy of using implants in MIS. So for example, this particular patient underwent a percutaneous pedicle screw fixation to stabilize uh, the two segments and a tubular disc decompression, discectomy, and uh, insertion of this cage, you, you know, underwent interbody fusion 
to achieve uh, uh, the goals of uh, long term fusion so this is how one uses uh, uh, navigation to insert screws when it comes to newer advances uh, uh, so once you start uh, uh, you know uh, succeeding in your uh, 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 accomplishments with regards to minimal access you push the envelope you can do uh, achieve these goals using uh, smaller uh, di lesser diameter tubes which means mi lesser morbidity uh, you explore other areas like the anterior cervical uh, you know approaches the posterior cervical uh, approaches basically foraminotomies discectomies etc uh, excising lesions uh, uh, from the neck back wherever i know even accomplishing uh, thoracic uh, decompression uh, so you also push the envelope so far that you know you can do all these procedures without actually sh stopping your uh, this is our experience uh, of uh, not stopping clopidogrel as well as aspirin uh, in minimal access surgeries so no one is denied of uh, surgery uh, again doing these cases under uh, local anesthesia local epidural anesthesia so the take home message is you start doing these tubes only when you buy them so take home these tubes that is my take home message thank you thank you dr kulkarni uh, for uh, completing your talk uh is is there any other question uh, from anybody uh, especially from the hss uh, department even the delegates if you want to ask any question you know dr arvind kulkarni is one of the pioneers of invalidity in spine surgery with more than 10 years experience it's time for you to you know if you want to ask a clear doubt this is the time you should do that sure uh, this this is dr shikami from hss uh, thanks for a great talk can you hear me Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I wanted to ask regarding the tubular uh, surgeries. I know you said uh, once you start, you need to uh, continue to push the envelope with your comfort level. But for people who are uh, used to doing open surgeries, what number of cases would you say is where you get over the hump from a uh, from a learning standpoint uh, with these tubular type decompressions? Because you know people are always reluctant to try. new techniques when they have uh, a good system in place they're very busy and they don't want to add the additional time from the learning curve how many approximately how many cases would you say to become facile with uh, minimally invasive tubular decompressions of such so i would uh, not go by the number of cases i can tell you step wise how to go about it so i would suggest you one to use you know these 18 mm tubes initially and do very straightforward discectomies you know a l4 l5 disc the maybe which is a shoulder disc which you can do easily using a microscope one should have first the good experience of a microscope without even using the tube so you can't just jump to the tube without knowing how to use a microscope so once you use a microscope and you know it becomes much more easier do a l4 l5 shoulder disc which is which is a taut easy disc you know which one can easily do do that and when you do that you when you do such cases try tilting the tube up down you know medially laterally inferiorly and explore and see what all you can see through this tube you know so keep you know within a particular easy case try to push your envelope in trying to visualize things above below try to uh, uh, angulate your instruments and see how far you can reach in different corners so that is how i would suggest one to proceed there is a question from the delegate uh, dr sandeep is asking if do all disc pathology of higher level to be addressed from contralateral side like l23 and l34 dr pulkar need to you yeah yeah so it depends on the tail of the disc herniation if it is pushed backwards you know if it is a posterolateral disc and if there is enough amount of facet which you can uh, sacrifice uh, without causing instability one can do from from the ipsilateral side alone but the one which i showed where the Uh, there is hardly any space ipsilaterally to go without compromising the facet joint uh, one has to go contralateral it depends upon how you read that particular axial section you know of that particular patient if it is a central disc of course it is very very difficult if it is a central disc probably one would end up doing a tilly for one would do what you would do i wish do a transforaminal discectomy yeah yeah i agree no, uh, can i ask one question 
Yeah, please, uh, Chitish, go ahead, please. So for these <coughs> large central discs, uh, is your choice to do a TLF even at the lower lumbar levels? No, not, not at the lower levels. I also go by patient symptomatology. If it is a back dominant leg pain, uh, you know, which many of these patients have, I would probably do a TLF. But if it is a dominant leg pain, it's not difficult. L4-5, L3-4, L5-S1, they're quite straightforward. So, you know what? Just my experience, I've had an issue in couple of these large central ones in the lower lumbar area as well. Um, and uh, maybe I try to do it only from one side with a little bit more retraction of the thecal sac and landed up with a deficit. Uh, mm. But uh, um, I, I, I had discussed this with, uh, I don't know whom, but uh, I mean, that person had told me this idea of, you know, doing an over-the-top decompression first, getting some mm. room on that side, before coming back on your side to kind of get the, get to that disc. Shetish, that was me. Oh, that was you. Oh, sorry. Great man. So, I remember that. Uh, I haven't yet applied that uh, ever before yet now since that case because uh, you know you know you get burnt once and uh, you kind of remember that case all the time. But what is your experience, Doctor Kulkarni? Is that something that you work? Yeah, so this is my video is not. It's been uh, the video is not. Uh, I'm not able to start my video. It's the host has stopped it. That's what it says. Now, anyways. So, in a stenotic canal with a disc herniation, whether it is central or lateral, you know. No, I'm uh, talking about a stenotic uh, canal. I'm just talking about good central yeah, disc. Let's yeah, say so the one is equina central. Yeah, yeah. So you you go, as uh, Vishal said, you know, you create good amount of space for you to retract uh, the root a bit. Second uh, option would be to go from the axilla. So, if you go from the axilla, there is enough space because the root is much more relaxed in the axilla because it is pushed laterally, not centrally. So no, no, I am one... talking about a huge, large central disc. You cannot really yeah. see anything dura on your axial section, you know. And you try so to one... go from the side and everything is tight. No, no. So, that's why you do a laminotomy so much that, you know, you can still see the, you can see the axilla also. So, you see the uh, central dural sac, you see the axilla, you put your nerve hook in the axilla and you can pull out the disc if it is a soft disc. Yeah, we do that even in like a more conventional approach as well where you can't get over the shoulder. But, you know, with these large central discs, I always find that, you know, getting the dura even retracted from the axilla also is not very easy. It is very no, no, that's why you need, to, you need to create enough space. You so, you, from, on the opposite more, side? On the opposite side? Go, at least go more centrally with your tube. Tilt your tube more. Tilt your tube. Okay. okay. Go to the center and then, you know. So what you need to do, Shetesh, here is yeah. uh, you have to take the base of the spinous process off and some part of the lamina on the opposite side. So that when you push back, there's some space for the uh, dural dural sac, sac to, to go move. rather yeah. than get squeezed uh, under the opposite uh, lamina yeah. there. So you do, so we did I one today morning. So it is a challenge, but yes, you can do it. Once you do the over the top. I want to tell the delegates also, if you have a stenotic canal and if you have a disc herniation, if you try to retract it, you know, without decompressing the, without excising the flavor, you will either create a dural tear or you will call it some deficit. So, you know, create enough space so that, you know, the root can be retracted a bit. Yeah, and, and also I think at least from my initial experiences, uh, I find that, you know, getting a judgment of the root retraction to the tube uh, uh, is a little difficult, at least for the initial few cases. You tend to do much more and you think you are doing enough, but you probably are doing too much. So, you know, it's best to handle the dural sac as if, you know, this is a very delicate area and there is spinal cord there. You know, don't do like a very aggressive retraction saying that, okay, this is just the cord icon and nothing is going to happen. It Believe me, things happen to it. So, you just have to be careful. In open surgeries, probably you can see it much better. But in uh, but, uh, that's just my experience. In the in initial few cases, I did land up with trouble getting, trying to retract uh, the nerve root and the dural sac a little bit too aggressive.
Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kulkarni. Uh, so I have one more question talk. if you have time. Quick, quick, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Kulkarni, you said that the your your if you are doing an over the top decompression or if you are doing a discectomy, you are more or less putting your tube at the same place. Where I find if I have to do an over the top, I would rather keep the tube a little bit more lateral. Even if I'm like if I if I plan to go over the top, I would take an incision a little bit more than one 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 point five centimeters. Is that no, no. what you do, or you keep the same? No, no. In fact, in fact, I'm more medial if I'm going over the top because I'll compromise less on the. Uh, I'll be much more closer to the opposite side if I'm more medial, and uh, the ipsilateral side I'm not much bothered about because with the with the angle curved of uh, you know carries in I can easily manage. Yeah, foramenotomy. So you so always much... do a, you always use a curved foramenotomy for the ipsilateral lateralisis. For decompression, yes. Yeah. yeah. Even for this central large disc herniation, where I need to create more space like in the lateral recess to retract the root a bit, I use this almost on every case. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shitaj. Uh, Ayush, you can go ahead with your talk on uh, your experience in endoscopic surgery. Thank you, everyone, and welcome, delegates. It's a pleasure and honor to be part of this uh, minimally invasive spine course. And I will be talking on, he, uh, Dr. Kulkarni went, uh, uh, showed you some excellent, excellent cases from tubular. And I will go to even smaller, even minimally invasive, which is the endoscopic spine surgery. And let's talk about the learning curve and pitfalls of endoscopic spine surgery. So this is my disclosure. I have been a tubular guy for many, many years, but I find endoscopy much more fascinating. And uh, this is what I have been flirting for for class two to three years now. So this is how I find open surgery. If you want to drink the water, you really need to dig a wide pond and you can extract the water. The other way is to dig a well, which Arvind Kulkarni showed, and this is what the tubular is. But if you are more enthusiastic, you want to see the dura up close and personal, it is the endoscopic spine surgery. So let's start with the two types. We all know that we have an interlaminal way and the transformal way. Let's start with the interlaminal. You know, the interlaminal is something I prefer starting with because it is a familiar anatomy. You already know your anatomy and it is a much versatile approach. Now let's see how the interlaminal approach goes through. So interlaminal approach is nothing. You use the natural corridor of the spine, which is the interlaminal corridor. You go through the window. You do use the natural corridor and do your surgery. This is how it looks like. Like any other surgery, you first encounter the muscle. This is a very tiny amount of muscle. You use this radio frequency proof to take out this muscle. You can see this is the cranial end, this is the caudal, this is the medial and the lateral end. The moment you remove this muscle, you have the flavor. Now, you need to do a small amount of flavotomy, just enough to reach the dura. And you see, this is what we do. We cut the flavor. And you don't need to remove the whole lot of flavor. You just need to cut small enough and dilate it. And that is the key. Because once you dilate it, the flavor becomes taut. And it's very, very easy to cut it without damaging anything which is underneath. So that's what we did. And once you have the opening, you can push your scope and you go underneath. So that is it. And then you identify your neural structure, whether it's the dura, with the cord. So we can just removing some of the fat pad, which is there, which is always there. In any surgery, no matter you do open endoscopy or tubular, and then you identify your disc level, you identify your dura, you identify your root, and you tackle whatever you want to tackle. So this is the anatomy which you need to see before starting an interlaminar endoscopic surgery, whether it's a disc, it's a decompression, or a whatever it is. And this is the same which goes for any other surgery. Now, things become interesting depending upon the pathology. If you have something like this, if a lateral disc, which is just irritating your nerve root, you can go lateral to the nerve root, you can retract the nerve root, and you can do your job. And the scope allows you to do that because you know you are up there, and this is how it looks like in a CM. You go there, you 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 just retract your roots, you take out the disc fragment, and then this is how it looks like when you're doing it. On the you, everything is on TV, it's on a screen, you're looking at the screen. And you remove the disc fragment, and the in the actual picture is something like this. 
So, so this is the end of it. You see a beautiful nerve root and you have decompressed it. Now, if you have a central, central disc, something which these guys are talking about, and it is very interesting what you can do here. Again, you can use the interlaminar approach. Now, to re retract the root from the lateral side is very, very difficult, and you will damage what you can. So you can go in the axilla. And this, I think, is very important because you are on through the scope, you can directly and end on the axilla. And even before retracting your roots, you do a discectomy from the axilla. And then, if needed, you can add a discectomy by retracting the root on the lateral side. That is the beauty of the uh, endoscope because it really allows you to see corners which you normally see. So that is how it is. And this is the end of the discectomy. You have a beautiful dura and a beautiful root. Let's go further. And you have a, the next case. And you have a case where you have a huge disc. This is what we have. It is going from central to lateral. And again, you can tackle this also endoscopically. Of course, this patient came with a complete, complete foot drop, which you can see in this video. Now, what to do now in this, in this something like this? You can, you can go identify your structure like the way we started with. You first go through the axilla. You don't want to retract the root. The moment you retract the root, this is what we were talking earlier. You're likely to damage it. You sort of debulk the disc. Once you debulk the disc, you will have enough mobility to mobilize your root. Instead of going over the top, doing the bony work, creating those space which we are all talking about, this is what you can do if you're an endoscopic surgeon. You debulk the root, debulk the disc, the moment you have debulked the zip, this, this is what will happen. It will give you enough space to mobilize your root. And then you angle it. You go over the root because you have an angle of 30 degree. And then you start working on the root. Even so, this is what I'm doing. So now, you know, I'm just teasing the root, not mobilizing, not pulling it. I'm going over the root. I'm using the angle of the scope and the root to work on the shoulder of the root. So while doing this, what you are doing is you're not moving them. You're not you're less likely to damage the dura or the root. And, and see, this is a big fragment here. And then you can just grasp it and take it out. And this is how it comes. These big fragments also can be taken out easily without even retracting much of the dura and root. And that is where I believe the beauty of the endoscopic surgery comes in. And this is just the disc coming out. It was such a huge disc. And I'll just show you the video. So you really need, need to take out the whole scope because it won't come through a 4.3 millimeter channel. So this is how it is. And you see, this is the disc. This is just one fragment. In this case, we ended up removing three, four fragments. And this is the end of the disc discectomy in this case, where the dura is free and the nerve root is free. And for no matter where an open tubular endoscopy surgeon, that is the aim of the surgery, to make sure that you have a free neural structure. And this is, the post-operative MRI of the patient. These are the disc fragment that I, which could be removed even for the endoscopy approach. And this is the post-operative MRI showing complete removal of the disc fragment. And the patient, fortunately, at a three months follow-up, recovered completely, completely. And you can make out from the spile of the patient and you can see the foot drop, which has recovered completely. The next approach is a transforaminal approach where you approach to the cambium strangle. So this is the cambium strangle. And this, again, is a bit tricky. And I started the interlaminal and then migrated to transformal. Still, only 20 to 30 percent of my cases are transformal because I feel more comfortable with the interlaminal. And this is a very, very specific targeting. You need to target your pathology and then take out the disc. And this is how it looks like, especially if you are on a higher level where the interlaminal window is very, very small. The transformal route comes very, very handy because you can approach it through the transformal route. And even for something like this, as central this where they're very small space, where, what you guys are all talking about, where you really need to decompress and do, you can exactly go to the pathology, target the central pathology and remove it. And then, you know, it, you make your enemy your friend and you win the battle. You use the pathology, the central compression of the dura to, to safely allow you the play to remove the disc. Because the, the disc itself is pushing the dura. So there is safe corridor for you to land your endoscope. And this is how it looks like. This is a transformal approach. And this is, this is once you are removing, this is how it is. And again, I will show you the post-op MRI just to show you that a complete discectomy can be done even at L235 using a transformal approach. Now, 
there are challenges to whatever you do, whether anything you pick up, you know, this is how a traditional open or tubular surgery look like. You have a microscopic vision, you have an assistant who helps you perform your surgery. And this is how an endoscopic surgery look like. If you see, this is my assistant helping me here. And if you look, this is the only assistant near to me and he's not even looking at the screen. So in on the other assistant is just handing his, his hand. So it is a single surgeon surgery. You have to do everything on your own. You have to use the system to do the surgery. Unlike a tubular system, it's a highly, highly mobile system. You need to control the mobility of the system. It takes you some time to, to be able to control the mobility of an endoscope. Now, epidural bleeds can be a nightmare. If you cannot see anything, you cannot do anything. And you really need to track, know how to tackle this. You need to be patient. You need to specifically target using a radio frequency probe to reduce the bleeding. So if you see, till I get out the bleeding points, I cannot do my surgery. And once you do, do take the bleeding out, you can go ahead and safely perform the surgery. So hemostasis again becomes a challenge when it comes to performing this endoscopic surgery. Other thing is neural retractor. As I was talking about, you don't have an assistant. You use the seat of the scope to, use, to, to re retract the neural element. And this again could be tricky, especially if you are new and, and you don't understand the nuances of how much to retract. You can very well damage the root. You can damage the cord. But once you have got that idea, you can separate out the dura neural element and work on the pathology side. For example, if you see now I only have the vision of the disc. Everything is out of my picture. So I can be aggressive. I can do my disc capture. The next is it opens a new frontier. And this is some, the, I just put up this case just to show you. This is a case, something like what Abhijit was talking about. And you see there's a disc. And there's a big osteophyte. And see, this patient was 32 years female. Again, we could have done it till if, but endoscopy allows you to do something which you cannot do without doing a fusion. So basically, you if you see this, the, the extruded disc is sort of protecting your dura. If you're coming from posterior, it is a pathology. It is a, your enemy. But you're going through a transformal route. It is your friend because it is retracting the, your dura and allows you to work here. And this is what we did. This is how we approach it. You can see there's a tracker, which is we navigated our endoscope and we could burr out the osteophyte. That is what I was talking about earlier when I saw the update case. So you go there, you use your uh, navigation. You see this is a burr and you can really track that osteophyte and burr it out and then do the discectomy. So in a, in a 32 year old, instead of doing the fusion surgery, you have done a, a, a decompression and discectomy. And this is how the setup looks like when you navigate them so and then you see many many new things i have been doing tubular uh, cervical foramen for many many years like four to five years i never saw a conjoined nerve root but look at this this is a endoscopic foramen to me and look how beautiful you can identify a conjoined root you can protect it and stu still do your job because the visibility you have then that is what endoscope allows you so so is it worth it if you see this patient with a foot drop and then walking with a one centimeter in season at three months without foot drop i believe it is worth it and in when it comes to to revision mis is a great thing but endoscope is still better this is my case operated open laminectomy and discectomy eight years back and then came with a two level disc prolapse and this is what all i did single one centimeter incision to do two level endoscopic discectomy and the rehabilitation and it does reduce your rehabilitation time and it does reduce your complication just to show you this is a video you can see where we had a, a dural tear and you see there's a small dural tear while doing the endoscopic surgery you can see there's a rent in the dura and this is the nerve root which is coming out now the beauty of this as dr rabin was talking about it is really once you take out the thing there's no dead space so you can really even if you have a dual tier there's absolutely absolutely not, not a problem and you can see here this is a post-operative mri and the moment you take out the scope the muscle simply falls back falls back and makes it a contained dual tier with no dead space to cause your trouble and this is why it is the next video will just show you so this is
this is a case of a this is the only rent you have made even in the flavor and the moment you come out of the tube the flavor collapses your 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 muscle collapses so act, you actually have no dead space so even if you have a dural tear it is dural tear in a contained space and this is the only amount of flavor you remove and then as the tube comes out the layers and layers of muscle simply falls back and it prevents you from having complication and this is what we published recently in one of our um, papers in asian spine journal that incident of dural tear in complication is significantly less if you are going the mis way again as your mobile phone cha are changing and becoming smaller smaller and but still becoming more effective every day so has the has been the evolution of my surgery into mis from open to tubular to endoscopic today and my take home message will be and we'll try to uh, again reinforce it in the days to come that endoscopy is one versatile technique which allows a surgeon to tackle range of pathology from cervical to lumbar spine endoscopy al approach allows for a faster recovery recovery it reduces its complication but it does have a steep learning curve and that's why you need to come to this course that's why you need to learn that's why you need to migrate from one technique to other and make it a perfect and but at the end whether no matter what you choose whether you choose to be a tubular surgeon or endoscopy surgeon you need to decide what works best in your hand so thank you thank you so much thank you ayush is uh, are there any questions yeah we just keep on yeah i yeah, just go ahead please excellent presentation and excellent uh, cases i have only one reservation about endoscopy you know the instruments are very expensive the endoscopic burr the endoscopic um, the by uh, the cautery and even the forceps are expensive and you need good quality instruments you can't do this in cases without sub optimal instruments in your hospital where everything has been funded it's different in in a, you know a hospital setup where patient has to pay for it it's, it's you know uh, suppose one instrument breaks or if you know they need a burr and everything so i think i think the cost of the instruments is and the fragility of the instruments is one concerning factor which i think uh, holds me from uh, moving to endoscopy and and disposable as well so 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 abhijit is sitting in one of the biggest hospital in mumbai i'm sitting in a small government hospital and he's talking about cost so that is the irony of the situation to start with but tell me let me tell you abhijit you buy a good instrument and it will last for longer so you use what we use is i i won't mind because uh, it's not nothing companies think so we bought a richard wolf and you know we have been doing for almost one half to two years one of my instrument has broken till date and we got it repaired from them if you buy an indian instrument or maybe even the chinese one to reduce your cost and that is where the problem starts they break they are very flexible and then as you do it you know the breakage and everything really becomes less so it's about driving your car you you have a bmw and you know how to drive it okay so it it doesn't break if you if you, and because you protect it because it's costly so that is where it lies and i don't have a bmw but i have a endoscope with me but you should be a one who should having all the endoscope in the world so go ahead my friend use the good ones try it and you won't regret it that is my from stay if it definitely i i thank you <laughs> any other questions uh, from our colleagues at hss uh, dr bolabo any questions so there's a question from the chat what is the probable cost of an endoscopy set so it depends what you want to do which company you go to whether you're going for a transformer interlaminar there are a lot of variation so you know we have put uh, some of the indian companies in the cadaveric workshop some of the ones i use which are better ones so you know it is all about what you want to do as i was talking you have a bmw a maruti a a kia to choose from you can choose it depends upon your budget but i'll recommend choosing the best of the instruments because they break and uh, if you have a good one the chances to break is less that that was a great presentation this is dr shikumbi from hss again um my question to you is twofold are you do you have any um experience with dual port endoscopy cuz what you described and what i saw in the video appear to be uniport that's one second question is can you comment on any complications with water management 
like third spacing of fluids and sailing and, and any complications related to that? Yeah, so great questions. I think, see, I started with uh, pure endoscopy, which is single portal. So I, have, I know guys who do equally good job, or maybe even better job than me with bi-portal, but I will only share what I know. So I have only experience with that. Coming to water management, okay. So what I do, I have a controlled water monitor with me when I'm using this case. So that it doesn't allow the pressure to go beyond that, which is 45 milliliter of mercury. Having said that, it is not at all a problem when you are doing a lumbar spine. But if you are doing a cervical, it could be an issue if you have the water pressure at very, very high, because of course you are close to, to the central nervous system. So that is where the water monitoring or the closed pump system comes into play. But I can tell you, if you are doing a lumbar, which is which is uh, which is most of the guys do without the system. You can just use the gravity assistant irrigation and you even if you're not monitoring those patients, you are absolutely, absolutely fine. But it's better to have if you can have it. So there are pumps which allows you to monitor the pressure of the water which you're using inside and that makes it a little safe. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Ayush. Uh, we'll uh, go ahead uh, with the next talk. Uh, uh, Dr. Abhijit Pawar to uh, give his experience on MIS t uh, which we'll be seeing a lot of in the uh, come, upcoming course tomorrow onwards. Uh, over to you, Abhijit. So thank you, Ayush. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Satyan for um, coordinating the session. Uh, so today we're going to talk about MIS t uh, workhorse in lumbar antibody fusion. So what is a workhorse? What is it? Something that is markedly useful, durable, and dependable. So similarly, minimal invasive TLF is a tried, tested tool for lumbar antibody fusions at all levels, from D12 to S1, proved and published. Now here we are going to start with a short video and demonstrate the minimal invasive TLF, uh, although this is with a navigation guided technique, so that you get a fair idea how this is done. So this is the patient position, the tracker is placed on the patient's spinous process, and the this is the OAM. The OAM is a 3D CT scan that comes in. We scan the patient. The scanning is done. The image is saved to the computer. The OAM comes out of the room. So the surgeon is standing out of the room till this time the OAM scanning is done. And now the surgeon comes in. The AP and lateral shoots are taken and guide wires are placed with 3D navigation control. The guide wires are placed accurately in the OAM and 3D navigation. And then you take a, I take a separate incision for docking the tube directly on the facet joint, place the first dilator followed by serial dilators. I tend to use the quadrant system. The maximum uh, diameter of the quadrant system is 22 millimeters, which gives you enough space uh, to do the facetectomy as well as to the, to the decompression. Place the quadrant. You can describe the quadrant to up to five centimeters. So there's enough space for decompression. And then under the microscope, uh, you do the overthrow of decompression on both sides, the ipsilateral and, uh, and contralateral side, and do the um, interbody fusion by disk space preparation. You can use a loops and uh, magnification loops and lights and do under um, those techniques as well. Once that interbody fusion is done, you place the screws uh, with a minimal invasive approach. Now, the, what the OAM does is it saves you from the radiation. So there's zero radiation to the surgeon with the OAM and navigation. Uh, otherwise, you can either use a lead gown and place the screws comfortably. And then you place the screws uh, and the rods. The procedure is complete. The trajectory is good lateral to medial with a good pullout strength. And this is how the incision looks like. Very, very predictable and easy in obese patients. Now we're going to start with some cases from D12 to L5S1. How this MIS lift is predictable and useful. This is a patient, uh, 74, year old, 74 year old female, obese patient, uh, history of laminectomy L45 two years back, developed uh, listhesis and instability at L45 and severe clodicant pain, obese with a lot of comorbidities. These patients are at risk of infection, so minimal invasive T lift is a boon in these patients. Uh, you place the percutaneous screws under navigation or X-ray CM guidance. Uh, good trajectory of the screws and then place the quadrant system. Mm. Or you can place the guide wires first, followed by 
the quadrant and decompression whatever you are comfortable with the position is good the patient is ambulating well uh, and the healing is great in this patient now, there is enough literature to show that as comparison of outcomes of this is a paper published in asian spine journal 2021 uh, from japanese uh, surgeons and the comparison of outcomes of oblique lateral interbody fusion um, with percutaneous fixation versus MIST for degenerative spondylolisthesis. They had about 86 patients, um, about 48 in each group. And the changes in physical function, quality of life index after OLIF and MIST lift was almost equivalent. They had OLIF had some superiority and psychological domain in their uh, article. This is another patient, grade 2 lytic spondylolisthesis, 37 year old, routinely seen patient in our OPD basis, grade 2 listhesis. Instability easily can be easily done with a minimal invasive approach uh, with the predictable results. Now, L5S1 can be a challenging level in the OLIF or XLIF techniques because you encounter the common iliac vessels, the right common iliac vein, the left common iliac arteries, and the ileal lumbar veins. So, you need an access surgeon at this level, and bleeding at this level can be catastrophic. However, the L5S1 MIST lift is proven and tested and published uh, with good results since long. Now, this is another case multiple level listhesis, grade, grade 1 listhesis in a 76 year old female, obese patient, lot of comorbidities, wheelchair bound. You see, there is an L34 listhesis as well as L5S1 uh, grade 1 spondylolisthesis. So, you need to fuse both the levels patient is unstable and wheelchair bound. So with it, with it, this minimal invasive T lift at all these levels, we, we skip the L4-5 level, we did a fusion with a, just the bone graft at L3-4 and a cage at the L5-S1. The patient did well and is ambulating well without independently without support. So in this elderly patients who are obese with comorbidities, the minimal invasive T lift uh, has stood the test of time and goes, gives excellent results. Another patient, a recurrent multi-level stenosis who had a history of decompression three, four years back, uh, a large stenosis at L4-5. Uh, you can easily do a minimal invasive T-lift by placing the quadrants retractors over the facet joints and placing the screws percutaneously. You avoid the scarring, scarred area of the previous surgery. You dock on the facet joint, it's a, it's a, it's a virgin area. You have enough bone graft. Uh, to do an interbody fusion. The advantages of minimal invasive TLF is does not require change of positions. Now, Ayush is used to do, do this surgeries in a lateral position. He's, he can do this percutaneous screws in lateral position and put a OLIF cage from the abdomen. I'm not comfortable with that. Needs an access surgeon. Um, if you are doing at the L4, 5 and L5, S1 level and the risk of vascular and lumbar plexus injury. So, L5, this MIST leaf has stood the test of time and does not need all these changes. Another patient, degenerative scoliosis and spondylolisthesis, 75 year old male with claudicant neurogenic claudication. Now, this patient was 75, a little fragile in health. We discussed the option about D10 to L5 S1 fusion or pelvis long fusion in this patient, but he was not willing for that long fusion because of the risk involved in the surgery. So, we did a selective symptomatic level fusion at L4-5 and L5-S1 where he had the lytic spondylolisthesis. This patient did well and he is ambulating significantly well after this surgery. Now, this is an article published in Spine Journal recently. The comparison of oblique lateral interbody fusion with minimal invasive transfer on the lumbar interbody fusion for treatment of lumbar degenerative disc disease, a prospective study. 71 patients in the OLIF group and 66 patients in the minimal invasive T-LIF group. The perioperative data, patient outcomes, radiographic outcomes and complications were compared between the two groups. Compared with minimal invasive T-LIF, the OLIF showed similar results in terms of patient reported outcomes, restoration of segmental lumbar lordosis angle and fusion rate and superior result with respect to restoration of disc height and lumbar lordosis angle operation time, blood loss, and length of hospital stay. However, 
in the conclusion they state that even though the complication rate of olif is higher than mis tilip it does not bring persistent substantial damage to the patients so all these articles suggest that the results of olif versus mis tilip are equivocal another patient l23 calcified disc um, now at this level the Sometimes you see the corners, so I'm a little scared of retraction. So I, I prefer a minimal invasive TLF in this patient because you go from the facet joint and the risk of injury is less. Um, safely can be safely done. L12 large disc, uh, calcified disc stenosis. You can easily do an um, minimal invasive TLF by placing the quadrant on the facet joint and avoiding retraction of the nerves. This is a T12 element large disc uh, with radicular pain in the patient. Retraction of the nerve roots can be a problem at this level because of the conus and so uh, MIST lift can be a fair option at this level. So the advantages of MIST lift is there is enough local bone graft, good restoration of segmental lordosis in all these patients. In a single or double level fusion results are almost similar to OLIF in or XLIF in most of the studies. Again, the cost, one of the limitations is with the only for the XLIF technique is the cost because of the use of BMP or you need to harvest the iliac crest. And the BMP has not only is the cost a concern, it does have side effects like the inflammatory reactions, radiculitis, retrograde ejaculation, male sterility, cancer, infection, osteolysis, ectopic bone formation and the cost of the BMP of a small pack BMP is about um, 1 lakh 20 thousand a large pack will cost around 1 lakh 50 thousand so in in Indian setup the cost is a big concern not only is the side effect so I feel the MIST lift has stood the test of time and the MIST lift still remains the workhorse for lumbar interbody fusion at all levels thank you Thank you, Abhijit, uh, for a nice uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I wanted to, uh, just to uh, start off the uh, questioning, uh, the MIS TLIF, of course, we know it can be used at all levels, uh, very good technique and can be, I mean, it's a workhorse. Uh, are there any uh, indications where you would not want to go with a MIS TLIF and you would want to go for another approach? Yeah, if the patient is a very thin patient, young patient, I don't think the approach matters. Even if you do an open surgery, you know, I, I think the results are similar. What I feel. If you're doing, a, if there is a patient has instability, the patient is lean and thin patient, uh, I would prefer an open approach as well. Okay. Uh, in this uh, case, uh, with uh, where you had that T12, uh, L1 or that T11, T12 uh, degeneration with anterior compression, uh, do you think uh, that maybe an anterior approach would be a better uh, bet or you think you can do everything from the uh, transfer is, angle here? You know, you know, the D, even the D12-11 axis with an axis surgeon, you're talking about an OLE for, I mean, you, it's, it's a difficult approach to access from the anterior approach, you know, at the D12 or L, L1, L2. You can access Trans the endoscope. endoscope Transthoracic approach, I mean. Transthoracic, oh, that's... I mean, I think that's a morbid approach. Why to go for a transthoracic approach when you can do it very easily with the posterior uh, fastectomy? You can use an endoscope. Okay. That is one choice. You can use an endoscope and reach that levels. But you know, a little tricky at this level. The rib comes into your way. Little scared of having the pleural injury or, but still people are doing it. Yeah, I used to it. Yeah. So I. I also believe that MIS TLIF remains the workhorse when it comes to MIS surgery and it still holds true for me. But you know, having an advantage of and knowledge of approaching few of the cases with OLIF, especially when you have adjacent segment disease or maybe a degen scoliosis or maybe once in a while tackling that cases with a endoscope, it, it does bring its own advantages, specifically in selected cases. And that is where I, I believe. Uh, the things are so so if you can and if you have all the armamentariums you can choose each specific case based on its merit and do it thank you i thought you had a question now you should now just accounting is talk on uh, that uh, that it's a it's a work 
I just I was just sort of oh. yeah yeah Dr. Kulkarni. Uh, so we have any questions from uh, our HSS colleagues, uh, Dr. Bolabo? I, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I think if you look at some of the newer cage technology, where the T lift cages that expand vertically and horizontally can give you an A lift footprint, I think that combined with the MIS technique posteriorly uh, is a very, very great option for patients where you want that. Uh, anterior column support. Now you have a bigger device that you can put in from a posterior MIS technique. So just a comment on that. Thank you, Bolo. Thank you. So if there is no, if there are no other questions. Uh, maybe we can think about concluding this uh, because we have a long day tomorrow as well. Yeah, Dr. Shivastu, has he, has he had any comments? Any conclusion note, Dr. Shivastu? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Vijay. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, all the approaches are good in different hands if you are trained well. And I think one must know the anatomy properly. That is the crux of any surgery. If you are thorough with the anatomy, you will be able to reach to that place, the desired place. Uh, exposure to the open surgery is important. Maybe it is a cadaver surgery, fresh cadaver surgery. You do it. And then you reach to this uh, deeper, uh, you know, dissection and these very specific endoscopic and uh, tubular surgery. I think that gives you a very good idea and uh, knowingly will not, you will not be damaging anything because you know about the anatomy. Now, this session was actually very good. Actually, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I hope all the delegates have the same feeling. Uh, we have been doing the open surgery. All of you have done it. And now the newer things, I think your approach is very specific. You target the lesion so well. I think it is a target approach. Sir? It may be endoscopy. It may be, you know, microscopic thing you, which you are doing. You're seeing like a tilip procedure. All these things are important. And wherever you feel that this, this lesion can be taken nicely with the endoscope. I think it is a very well targeted surgery and it should be encouraged. It should be encouraged. And a day will come where more and more cases will be operated through this uh, you know, interlaminar approach which Dr. Ayush shown just now. Okay, So uh, that is my comment. Okay. That is my comment and I really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you for your presence and your valuable comments. They were really helpful for the upcoming spine surgeons. Thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to thank all our uh, delegates, uh, all our uh, faculty members here and uh, our uh, colleagues from uh, HSS Hospital. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, inputs. Uh, it's been a great learning curve and we hope to do more of these in the future. Uh, and uh, I'll, I guess we'll all meet uh, tomorrow for the uh, MIS course. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so, I last last yes, statement. Department. Tomorrow we all meet, and uh, uh, whatever you have seen is just the prequel. You will see everything which we just talked about, from OLIF to MIS TLIF to endoscopy, and even we have the best and best of the faculty to treat you. That we start tomorrow with the breakfast at ten thirty sharp, and everyone please come and enjoy the breakfast. You cannot start a day empty stomach and learn anything. So that is the idea. So let's meet over at breakfast and take breakfast the Breakfast is so late, Ayush, 10.30. Yeah, because, because, because they are coming from far off places. So we have given some. So the course starts at 11.30. That's okay. why we, the idea was to allow them to come if they want to come in the morning. It was very, very planned that way so that we have a late start. Because some of them, they wanted to fly early morning. That's All right. right. Thank you. Thank you, Ayush. That will be the second, right. second breakfast of the day. Yes, sir. That will be the second breakfast of the day. <laughs> 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 and and we have a five course meal including lunch dinner cocktail everything and a surprise package as well i promise you will enjoy it just come there everyone please all right all right I used all right thank you everybody thank you thank you thank you thank you thanks